a slave master is a slave master whether he's controlling you in the interest of harm or controlling you in the interest of his own benefit and unfortunately African people have not been able to distinguish between a slave master and someone who is doing some sort of benevolent service for the sake of that service there's no college, no institution, no effort, no corporation I know of funded by Europeans that in some way, shape, or form does not serve the interests of the European who funds it. And unfortunately, we have become so greedy for the help of other people and so dependent on white love in the form of philanthropy that we can't see that the funding that we're being given is being used as a noose around our leg our neck to control our behavior. For example, if you take the NAACP and Urban League, both of them started by Europeans for the interest, so-called interests of black people. They may fight for some degree of progress, but there's always a limit, an invisible ceiling on how far they will actually take the progress of the race. They fund you to control you. No European is going to fund any African initiative that seeks to make the African a equal to the European. Equality is a sin in European culture for black people. So everything is done to make sure that whites will always be given advantage over blacks. See, white supremacy has two fists. The left fist is white racism against black people. The right fist is white privilege for white people. It's two hands. Okay, and what we fail to realize is that when Europeans fund black people, they fund them for their own destruction. They fund you to control you. In fact, I've come across some research recently that says the FBI and the CIA are actually funding black organizations unbeknownst to the black organization simply to control their direction because if the money you need for progress is coming from me I can erase that progress overnight just by stopping the funding the only way we will be able to achieve what we need to as a race on this earth as was taught to us by all of the great pan-Africanists from John Brown Russworm to the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey is to do it by ourselves and for ourselves context of white supremacy uh, gusty renegade justice uh, in for another program uh, to bring constructive information on racism white supremacy what it is and how it works uh, thank you everyone for tuning into the broadcast um, hopefully you will get constructive information uh, that sound clip uh, from the documentary film uh, hidden colors uh, Tariq Nasheed uh, brought the film out. Uh, he was on the program just a few weeks back. Uh, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing uh, is in it. Uh, Dr. Phil Valentine, uh, our guest for today's program, and many others. Very constructive film. I would encourage folks to check it out. Uh, our guest uh, making his fifth visit to the context of white supremacy. Uh, always a high honor to have him on the program. I think he has a ton of constructive information to help non-white people uh, correct some of our behaviors immediately to solve this problem. Uh, Mr. Umar Abdullah Johnson, uh, are you with us, sir? Uh, yes, sir. Peace and blessings, Brother Jeff. I thank you again for the invitation to return to the show. It's my honor. The pleasure and privilege is ours. Um, thank you so much for sharing some of your time with us. I know you are always super busy. I wanted to start, uh, if you could let uh, our listeners, because a lot of the folks who listen to the program, uh, they are big-time supporters of your work, and they would like to be uh, kept in the know about what you're doing and what they should be on the lookout for. So if you could give us an update, that would be great. Uh, yes, indeed. First and foremost, I'm about to begin work on a full-length documentary entitled The Psychoacademic War Against Black Boys. And I'm currently looking for parents who are adult men, at least the age of 18 or higher, who are willing to tell their story to the world on film about what they went through as a student in one of the schools here in America, be it public school, charter school, private school or parochial school, if you are a black male who is at least 18 years or older, which means you do not need your parents' consent, and if you were mistreated in the school, if you were medicated, if you were special ed educated, if you were incarcerated by virtue of the school police or the uh, public police coming into the school building to arrest you, if you were mistreated, uh, miseducated in any way, shape, form, or fashion, and if you're willing to courageously tell that story, to other black people so they can understand that indeed there is a psychoacademic war going on against black boys, please email me 
a brief summary, a paragraph or two of what you went through, who you are, because I'm going to be screening the uh, different summaries that I get to find the ones that I think would best suit the documentary. If there's any parents out there who are willing to tell the stories that you've been through, your son need not still be in public school. He might be a grown man, but if he was ever mistreated in public school, it could have been 20, 30, 40 years ago. If you're still willing to tell that story, I want you as well. And if there's any parents out there who give consent for their sons to tell their own story, who are still in school, I also would like to hear their stories as well. And again, you can send that to my email address, Umar Abdullah Johnson at yahoo.com. I'm also on Facebook, and you can also give me a ring, area code 215-989-9858. The website isn't up yet, but you can definitely get me through phone, email, or Facebook. And so that's what I'm working on right now. So, again, anyone who's interested, please, please, please get in contact with me because I don't want to leave out any good story that I would have wished in hindsight I included in the documentary. Um, on Saturday, June the 11th, I will be speaking in Austin, Texas. Again, on Saturday, June the 11th, I will be speaking at the Greater Calvary Bible Church and Abundant Life Learning Center. That is located at 6510 Berkman Drive in Austin, Texas. The uh, zip code there is 78723. Uh, that will be from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., so that's in the morning. A three-hour workshop for parents and educators and anyone else in Texas who wants to learn more about the psychoacademic war against black boys. Uh, just to let everyone know, here in Philadelphia on Sunday, June the 12th, the Odun Day, which is the largest East Coast celebration of African culture, will be taking place in South Philadelphia. Also, uh, I will be speaking at the Fatherhood Festival, which will be held here in Philadelphia on Saturday, June the 18th, at the Convention Center in Center City from 9 to 4. We'll be encouraging black fathers from all across the world to come to Philadelphia on Saturday, June the 18th, at the Convention Center for the 6th Annual Fatherhood Festival. That will be from 9 until 4 on that day. I'll also be presenting some awards at the Cecil B. Moore Recreation Center Award Ceremony for Black Men that will be at 2 o'clock at the Cecil B. Moore Rec Center, um, excuse me, at the Martin Luther King Rec Center on Cecil B. Moore Avenue, Saturday, June 18th at 2 o'clock. i got a couple of graduations. I'll be speaking at Longstreet graduation here in Philadelphia on June 15th. Also, Strawberry Mansion High School's graduation on June 15th. Potter Thomas Elementary School graduation on June the 16th. I'll be speaking in New Jersey at the Emily Fisher High School graduation June the 17th. I'm also tentatively scheduled to be speaking in New York City Thursday, June the 16th at the Albany Housing Projects in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Again, Thursday, June the 16th, Crown Heights, Brooklyn at the Albany Housing Projects and that will probably be post-traumatic slavery disorder. I will be on the radio again Tuesday, June the 21st with Ms. Rashida Jabbar. She hosts a radio show for the black community entitled The Flip Side. I'll be speaking in Durham, North Carolina, Saturday, June the 25th at the Stafford L. Warren Library. Again, that's Saturday, June 25th, Durham, North Carolina, at the Stafford L. Warren Library from 1 to 5. That's located at 1201 Fayetteville Street. Uh, if anyone needs any more specific information on any of the speaking engagements, please feel free to send me an email so I can give you specific info. For example, if you're interested in vending and you need contact info, shoot me an email. I'll be speaking in Syracuse, New York, Thursday night, July 7th, and Friday night, July 8th. Up there with Sister Twiggy and my good friend, Brother Ross Simeon. They're going to be having their Bakulu celebration, annual celebration, of the organization that they have up there, a lot of conscious brothers and sisters up in Syracuse, New York. I'll be there the 7th and the 8th, so please come through and show support for that. I'll be speaking at Greatest for Prison here in Pennsylvania on Friday, July the 22nd. Me and the prisoners at Greatest for it, we're going to be working on a powerful Pan-African Prisoner Repatriation Project. I said Pan-African Prisoner Repatriation Project. One of the things that black leadership has not been doing thus is looking for ways to reconnect Africans here 
back to our ancestral homeland, and more specifically, looking at a way that we can, number one, get our brothers out, out of prison, number two, give them something constructive to do, which would allow them to earn a livelihood, and number three, at the same time, contribute to the uplift of the mother continent. Most black men in prison are in prison because of miseducation and ac economic castration. They have skills. We have electricians in prison. We have plumbers in prison. We have mathematicians in prison. We have lawyers in prison. We have medical doctors in prison who are sitting there not doing nothing. So through the Pan-African Prisoner Repatriation Program, we are going to influence the African Union as well as the United States government to let black men who are in jail, who choose to, who choose to, because this is a volunteer effort, any black man in jail who is willing to spend the rest of their prison term in Africa building and contributing to the uplift of their mother continent will be able to do so. And I firmly trust that someone who goes to the continent, I firmly trust that a lot of our brothers, once they go to Africa, many of them will choose to stay in Africa and not come back here to this hellhole. So this is something that we're going to uh, pioneer here in Pennsylvania. But if there's anyone listening who would want to get involved with the Pan-African Black Male Prisoner Repatriation Project, please get in touch with me. This is going to be serious. We need to have a national conference. And again, our sole objective is to get the United States government to release our brothers from incarceration slavery and let them go back home to where they belong and use their intellect and their time to contribute to the uplift of our race. It is a win-win situation. I will also be at the Islamic Heritage Foundation Retreat, which will be here in Pennsylvania, Villanova University, Sunday, July 24th, for some workshops on anger management for the African-American Islamic children. I'll be in Baltimore, Maryland, for a week-long conference with black juveniles in Baltimore that will be from Sunday, July the 24th, all the way until Friday, July the 29th. I'll be speaking at Cheney University, our first black college. I'll be at Cheney University's NAACP student conference from Friday, July the 29th until Sunday, July the 31st. And on Sunday, July the 31st, I'll be speaking in Harlem, New York City at the Harriet Tubman Learning Center the title of my presentation will be Ridding Ourselves of Our European State of Mind. Ridding Ourselves of Our European State of Mind. And that will be at the Harry Tubman Learning Center, 250 West 127th Street in Harlem, New York City. And that will be on Sunday, July the 21st. And I believe we're getting started at 4 o'clock. Also got a couple events in August, Saturday, August the 6th. I'll be speaking at the Amer American Zion Church in Brooklyn, New York City, for their Stop the Violence Back to School Rally. So for all your New York listeners, please come on out and support the American Zion Church in Brooklyn for their annual Stop the Violence Back to School campaign that will begin at 12 noon. They are located in Brooklyn at 54 McDonald Street in Brooklyn. I will be in the Bahamas, the Caribbean, the Bahamas, doing work with my Bobo Shanti, Rastafari brothers and sisters, and Priest Blyden, who is a descendant of one of the grandfathers of Pan-Africanism, Edward Wilmont Blyden. He's a Rastafari Bobo Shanti priest in the Bahamas, and I'll be building with him from Monday, August the 1st, until Friday, August the 5th. There's also a possibility that I may be going over to Ghana to do some work as well. Wednesday, August the 17th, I'll be in Chicago, Illinois, for the Glenwood Public School District, doing some teacher training there. I will be speaking with the younger son of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, Dr. Julius Garvey, the younger son of Marcus Garvey and myself. We will be speaking together in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The Bobo Shanti Rastafari Brothers, they have a Roots Foundation, and they're going to be having a Marcus Garvey extravaganza, extravaganza week as well as an extravaganza dinner. And Dr. Julius Garvey and myself will be speaking on that day. Also, earlier that day, I'll be speaking in Eatonville, Florida, at the first annual Marcus Garvey Cooperative Economic Symposium. So if you're in Florida, you've got two events that you can check out on Saturday, August the 20th. And then, of course, on the next day, Sunday, August the 21st, the anniversary of the Nat Turner insurrection, the anniversary of the assassination or martyrdom of George Jackson, the anniversary of the Haitian Revolution, I'll be celebrating my 37th birthday. Wow. 
<laughs> that is uh, no coincidence. No coincidence. No coincidence. Wow. Um, for people out there who, I mean, that's you talk about staying on the grind against racism, white supremacy. Uh, for folks out who uh, might want to attend some of those events, as many as they can, um, can you give them, uh, I guess, contact information, um, whatever you want to give out, email or phone number again? Certainly, certainly. Phone number is area code 215-989-9858. Again, 215-989-9858. This is also the phone number that you can use if you're having issues with your children, if you have sons or daughters who are being sucked up in the psychoacademic war against black children, if there's any parents listening, educators listening, concerned community activists listening, if you need to put on a workshop, a symposium, a seminar for your parents to teach them how to fight, protect, and advocate for the rights of the children in public, charter, private, or parochial school, please get in contact with me if you need me to review a psychoeducational report. Please get in contact with me so I can review that and let you know whether or not I think your child is properly evaluated. And if not, I can tell you how they can be properly evaluated. So please don't call me during the show because I'm actually on my phone talking to Brother Gus conducting this interview. So please don't call because you'll interrupt the conversation. But actually, I prefer folks get in contact with me by email only because I get so many calls and my voice mailbox tends to be filled. And you can reach me by email at Umar Abdullah Johnson at Yahoo.com, also on Facebook. But please don't message me on Facebook. I tend not to check my messages that often. If you just want to leave me a comment or shout out as an inbox message on Facebook, that's fine. But if there's a serious communication, if you're trying to schedule an event or you need some immediate emergency consultation, you need to email me. I check my Facebook wall, but I don't check my Facebook inbox as often. And I do fill up quickly. So if you're trying to get me for an event, please don't wait to the last minute. Unfortunately, I've had to cancel on several organizations because they were calling me with only two weeks to go prior to an event. As you can see, I'm booked all the way through the summer. I do have some summer dates, particularly during the week, okay, and also on Sundays as well. I've still got a couple of Fridays and Saturdays. But if you want to set something up, don't wait to the last minute because I fill up quickly. I had a brother call me today who wants to book me for November. Summer hasn't even started, and he's looking at the fall. So please don't delay. You've got to get me the dates. I know you don't see me on television, but people tend not to realize how busy I am. But I am pretty much in demand, and I do fill up quickly, so please do not delay. Umar Abdullah Johnson, context of white supremacy. Um, let's see. I will uh, I'll defer. I'll see if uh, Justice, if she uh, is ready to ask her questions. If not, I have some myself. Justice, are you there? Oh, wait a minute. I should check her line. Justice, uh, your line should be open if you uh, are ready with your questions. Uh, feel free. Um, can I be heard? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Um, greetings, uh, Umar. Um, Please, Quinta. Um, it says uh, on the website, blackspeakers.com, as an educator, psycho... psych psychologist, uh, therapist, and historian, Umar, you uh, considered an authority on the education of African-American children and on mental health in the black community. Why are you considered an authority on the, on the education of African-American children and mental health in the black community? Well, I think that probably speaks to the amount of experience I have in the field of education and in the field of school psychology in particular. I've been at this well over 11 years. I've been studying the mind of children since I was 18 years old. Um, and so having spent about a generation, 20 years, studying children academically and working with children physically and directly and then having my advanced training in the field of psychology, child development, and education, I have been considered an expert by virtue of that work. But even more so because of the position and the stance that I take, I'm one of the few black male school psychologists in this country, period. But I'm also one of the few black school psychologists who's willing to tell the truth about the miseducation of our children. Many black educators and psychologists are afraid to tell the truth, Princess. And the reason why they're afraid to tell the truth is because many of them 
actually earn their livelihood by way of the psychoacademic war against black children. In other words, there's thousands of black psychologists, thousands of black reading specialists, thousands of black special ed teachers, thousands of black principals. Uh, you have thousands of black speech and language therapists. You have thousands of black occupational therapists. And a lot of them, not all, because I know a lot of good ones who I work with regularly, but a lot of them get paid by way of misdiagnosing our kids with problems that they don't have so they can build the system and milk the system. One of the blessings about me is that I'm self-employed. Most school psychologists are not self-employed. Most school psychologists work for a school district or some form of European agency. I have been blessed enough to be able to maintain a livelihood working in private practice and at the same time maintain my commitment at all costs to the defense of black public school children. So not only is it it's also my unapologetic manner through which I approach the struggle that is facing our children. I think that's pretty why that's pretty much why a lot of folks have given me expert status in this area. <clears throat> why are you currently hosting a psycho educational community lecture series at the African American Museum in uh, Philadelphia? Because the greatest weapon used against black parents is misinformation and ignorance. The greatest weapon used against black parents as it relates to the miseducation, homosexualization, effeminization, psychotropic medication, incarceration, isolation, and extermination of black males, those five steps, the biggest weapon is the ignorance and misinformation that they feed our parents. Many black parents who put their children in special ed do so, not knowing that their child is not going to benefit. They are sold a false bell of goods through the public school system, the charter school system in particular, and even in the private school system and parochial school system. Now, even though private and parochial schools are not required to have special education, they are known to kick kids out and send them back to the neighborhood charter and public school under the allegation that they cannot keep up with children in the private school and in the parochial school. So all four types of schools are involved in this war against our children, and our parents need the information, Princess. They need to know that your child is not likely to learn anything in special ed. They need to know that your child is likely to drop out if you put them in special ed by virtue of the lowered self-esteem and the emasculation of the ego that our boys are going to deal with. They need to know that 93% of white public school teachers are women, and they could care less about their child. They need to know that whenever I diagnose their child as retarded, or learning disabled, or autistic, or emotionally disturbed, or if I put them in special education for ADHD, or if I say that they're deaf or blind, or they have a traumatic brain injury, or an orthopedic impairment, if I give them one of the 13 special education disability diagnoses, they will go in special ed, but the school will get money. Our children are being put in the school incarceration machine. It's a school incarceration machine so that the school can make extra money. And unfortunately, Princess, it's about to get worse because, as you probably know, I'm sure you're well read as a youngster, that a lot of school districts, by virtue of the economic situation that was created in this country by Wall Street, it wasn't an accident, it was created in this country by Wall Street to take power away from certain economic orders and shift power to other economic orders, namely those who supported and endorsed President Obama's candidacy. So this was engineered, just like the crash of 29 was engineered. But anyway, getting back to my point, by virtue of this engineered economic disaster that we have in America, you're going to see more black children get put in special ed. You're going to see more black children drop out of school. You're going to see more black children get suspended, expelled, put in discipline schools. And how can I say that? How can I predict right now that next year when our children come back, we're going to see more special ed, more dropout, more school police? How do I know this? Why? 
because class size, on average, is going to increase by about 10 students. So right now, the average black child is in the class with 28 to 32 students. Next year, they're going to be in a class with 32, okay, to 40-something students. So when the teachers come back from the summer vacation, white middle-class women, they're going to look out in that class, and they're going to say, I don't want to teach all these black kids. This is too many. And to be honest with you, they're right. That is too many for a teacher to handle. But it's not just the fact that it's too many children. It's too many black children. I want to make that clear. It's too many black children. If they were all white, they might tolerate it. But we're talking about black children. So you know what's going to happen? The teacher on the first day of school is going to earmark five of those black boys for special ed. She don't even know them. Haven't even taught them one day. But she has already made up her mind that five of these kids are going to special ed, not because they have a learning problem, but I have too many kids. And the best way to reduce my class size is to do what? Put them in special ed. That way they get out of my classroom. That also does what? Bring money into the school. So the principal is also going to be looking to put more black boys in special ed because yeah. if you want to get some money guaranteed, it's through special education. You're going to see more kids getting arrested. Why? Because they're trying to reduce the numbers. So an incident that would have normally gotten you a suspension is now going to get you arrested. And in most states in this country, after you have been arrested, you are not allowed to go back to the regular public school until you have been through some sort of alternative transition program, most of which are poorly organized and poorly run, and they ultimately lead to dropout. So when they tell those young men that you can't go back to school, they're basically telling them to drop out of school because there really is no meaningful program for black juveniles who have to come out of placement. So this economic downturn that we see right now, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, is the best justification for why black people need to get up off their rear end and start building schools for black children. These next 10 years, we are going to see a pillage against black people like we've never seen. It's going to start next year through public education. You're going to see more juvenile placed children. You're going to see more black men going to jail. And why? Why are so many black kids being miseducated? Why are so many black men in jail? Because America doesn't know what to do with them, doesn't want anything to do with them, and is trying to get rid of them. All this is is a Negro removal project. They are deliberately reducing the numbers of black people in this country on purpose because, number one, we're no longer needed. That's number one. And number two, those of us who have the means of giving back to the community and creating some sort of black community infrastructure, which we've never had since the Civil Rights Movement, okay, because we are neglecting our duties that helps the government use crime and miseducation and economic castration and the homosexualization to exterminate the race. So it's going to start next year. It's going to get worse when President Obama is out of office. And I don't know whether Council on Foreign Relations and the Bilderbergers and the Rothschilds and the Order of Rome, I'm not sure whether or not they have made their decision as to whether they're going to give him another term yet. But presidents are chosen before they are selected. And normally by this time they have a pretty good idea with about a year and a few months to go. They probably already made up their mind as to whether or not Obama is going to be president for another term. And whether he is or he is not, as soon as President Obama is out of the White House, another prediction, as soon as President Obama is out of the White House, black people in America better head for Africa and the Caribbean as fast as they can. Because when he is gone, we are going to get a racial backlash like we have never seen since the Tulsa, Oklahoma riot. White people are going to go down shooting and harassing, firing, miseducating, and marginalizing black folk in a way like you and like you have never seen. And why are they going to do this? Because black people for four years without reason and without justification have been thumbing their nose at white folk saying that the president is black as if they had gained something. So white folk are standing at black people like they're crazy asking themselves, why are you celebrating this man as if you all are in power? So because of our bragging ignorance and because of our 
imbecile tendency to celebrate a victory that we have not won. White folks are waiting in the wings to repay the favor. And unfortunately, and I hope I'm wrong, although I think I'm not because politics is a science, they are going to reward us for our ignorance and blind loyalty to a black man who wants nothing to do with us. Can you please name at least five ways of how the system of racism, white supremacy, affects you as a black male today? Very much so. Number one, surface racism. Surface racism basically deals with the fact that you're black, irrespective of anything else. And by virtue of being black, surface racism operates by automatically suppressing any attempt you have to be successful in this society as a black man or as a black woman. For example, I'm working on my doctorate degree. Haven't earned it yet. Most of my white classmates graduated five years ago. In fact, all of them are graduated at this point. I'm the only person left, and I was the only black male in my cohort. So just by virtue of me being black, the powers that be in that particular institution of higher learning and every institution of higher learning deliberately set about to suppress and keep me from earning that little dirty piece of paper that I'm not even going to want once I get it. So we have to realize that most of racism at this point is institutionalized. So, of course, you have that faith racism, but then you also have racism in the law. See, that's what law stands for, L-A-W-S. The word laws stands for the legal arm of white supremacy, the legal arm of white supremacy. That's what laws are. So when black people go around talking about we got rights and we got laws, we start to realize that the only right and the only law that matters in this world is might and power. The only, the only way black people can argue for anything in this society is to organize ourselves and fight for that which we need. You cannot use the Constitution because that's a pro-slavery document. You can't use none of the laws that were written in this country because you have never been acknowledged to be a citizen ever in United States history. So you got face value racism, you got institutional racism, then you have white privilege. Now, white privilege is what? It is the deliberate attempt to make sure white people always outperform, supersede, and benefit from what the society has to offer over and above anybody black. White privilege. I'll give you an example. Let's say you graduate from high school. You're straight A's. You're National Honor Society. You want to go to a particular university. You have a white girl. She didn't have straight A's. She was a National Honor Society. She was a BC student. But guess what? She ends up with a four-year scholarship, and you do not just because she's white. That's what you call white privilege, holding up white people. White racism is suppressing black people. But the biggest measure of racism in America princess is the economic disparity that exists between black people and white people. For example, we keep hearing about this black middle class. There's no black middle class in America. The word class is a Marxist concept that means ownership of the means of production. So in order for you to be middle class or upper class, you must have some degree of control, some degree of control over the industries that make America the capitalist giant that it is. In other words, you control real estate. You control industry. You control airlines. You control shipping lines. You control factories. You control machinery. You produce and distribute. To be a member of a class, middle class or upper class, to be a bourgeoisie, you have to have the ability to control production. Black people don't own any institutions. So how are we going to control production? We can't. So the term black middle class is the biggest lie that's ever been pushed on the black community. If you look at the group that is labeled white middle class, you will see that they do have control over the means of production. A white middle class person does own real estate, does own businesses, does own a multinational corporations. They are majority owners of stock corporations that publicly trade on Wall Street. I'm not talking about minority ownership that black people have. I'm talking about minority ownership. To give you an example of what I mean, Princess, you can take a white person who makes $80,000 a year, upper middle class, and you can take a black person who makes $80,000 a year, upper middle class, supposedly, 
on the surface, they look like they're equal. But guess what? The black person's $80,000 is in the bank, and that's the only place it's ever going to stay, in the bank. The white person's $80,000 is tied up in investments, real estate, land, industry, multinational corporations, production, and distribution. So even though it looks like they're worth $80,000 and that they're equal to the black person, because their money is tied up into capitalism, okay, just by virtue of that, that $80,000 that the white person has will probably be about $800,000 within five years. And that $80,000 that the black person had will be spent up probably on cars, houses, clothes, daycare, and expensive jewelry that they don't need. So there is no equ equity in America between black people and white people. When we got out of slavery, we owned one half of 1% of all the wealth in this country. When slavery ended, when they passed the 13th Amendment in 1865, approximately 145 years ago, we owned one half of 1% 1 of all the wealth in this country. Here we are. Fast forward to 2011. May 30th, 2011, and guess what? We still only own one half of 1% 1 of all the wealth in this country. The United States was created by rich, white, property-owning men with power and privilege in order to vote in early America, you had to own land. You had to be a giant of industry or capitalism. You had to be in the position to control cotton, sugar, rum, or any of the other products in this country, timber, and et cetera. There is no power in America without wealth, not a bank account, not cash, not money, not lottery tickets. But wealth, wealth is that which earns you money even when you're not working. White people are home right now watching TV, but their bank account is steadily growing through the night because it's tied up in investments, investments that black people are not allowed to participate in. Understand this, princess, and they never talk about this. The reason why black people cannot catch up to white people, and this brings me to economic racism, banking racism, industrial racism. The reason why black people can't catch up to white people is because they don't give us access to the capital that we need to open the industry to be able to compete with theirs. Let me give you an example. You want to open up a big sneaker company. You want to challenge Nike, and you want to challenge Adidas, and you want to challenge Reebok. Well, guess what? If you want to challenge them, you're going to have to put factories in different countries, you would have to come up with a massive multi-million dollar advertisement campaign. You have to create a distribution network. You've got to have planes and you've got to have ships. You've got to have trucks. You've got to have vans so you can fly, float, and mail your sneakers all across the world whenever somebody orders a pair off the Internet. So in order for you to be in a position to compete with Nike, you're probably going to need a $50 million loan. There's no bank in America that's going to give you that as a black woman. There's no bank in America that's going to want to give you that as a black woman. Let's say I want to open up a TV station. I want to compete with ABC and NBC and CBS, and I want to compete with Fox. In order for me to do that, I'm going to need a $75 to $100 million loan. I've got to get my networks up. I've got to get my satellites up. I need a $100 million loan. There's no bank in this country, even if i got A1 credit, who's going to give me that type of money. The reason black people don't catch up to white people is because the banks, the banks follow a law that I relate, that I call the zero tolerance law on black economic expansion. The zero tolerance law on black economic expansion. No black person in this country is ever going to get a loan that exceeds $2 million. Why? Because if they never give a black person a loan that exceeds $2 million, they never have to worry about competition with black people. And in the words of John D. Rockefeller, the patriarch of the Rockefeller dynasty, he said himself that competition is a sin. Prince says there is no such thing as a free market. When you turn on the news and they get the economic report, they keep talking about how we live in this great free market where anybody can get rich overnight just by using their brain and using their money and by pulling themselves up by the bootstraps. Princess, 
That is a lie. Most white people in this country who got money, they got it intergenerationally. They got it through slavery. They got it through white folk who had businesses who may not have gotten that money through slavery, but who had access to what? Capital from the banks so that they can build their economic capital. We don't have that. So when a black child is born, he's born broke. When a white child is he had me put away from great granddad and grandma and mom and pop. It's not that black people don't want to do better, but in order to do better in a so called free market economy, in order to do in a so called free market economy, you gotta have access to capital. Now, is there a way around the white banks? Of course there is a way around the white banks, as I wrap this comment up for you. That is for what? Rich white black people. Excuse me, rich white black people. Actually that was correct. They are rich white black people. But any rich Bill Cosby, your NBA superstars, NL superstars, to create a black savings and loan association. Create a black savings and loan association. Bill Cosby could sit on the board. Oprah Winfrey could sit on the board. Bob Johnson could sit on the board. Michael Jordan could sit on the board because it's their money that they're loaning out. They review our proposals, and they put forth an initiative where they deliberately seek to get black people access to the capital that they need to compete with white corporations. That is the way out of this. The problem is most rich black people are too afraid to help poor black people because most of them made their careers entertaining white people. In other words, they got rich making white people feel comfortable. Oprah Winfrey got rich making white people feel comfortable. Bill Cosby got rich making white people feel comfortable. Michael Jordan got rich making white people feel comfortable. And because of that, and because of that, they are too afraid to reach back into the ghetto and pull some of us out with them. Last thing I want to tell you is this, Princess. Another reason why black people are going back to the future. In other words, we look like we're making progress, but we're going backwards. But we can't tell because of our ignorance. One of the reasons why is because black people are content with information, but they are not ready to build institutions. Let me say this again. The black community, the conscious community in particular, has contented itself with information, but they have done nothing to build institutions. I want to be very, very clear about that. When you look at most black organizations, they're talking. Good information. Then elections. Good information. Presentations, programs, events. Good information. I'm not rejecting or criticizing the information. I'm not saying that we should stop collecting information. Because in this stage of informational warfare, we need as much as we can get. So I want people to be clear. I'm not saying we should stop the pursuit of information. I'm saying that we should stop being content just with having it. We should stop being content just with knowing. I see brothers and sisters who are addicted, addicted to what's going on with black people in the music industry. They're addicted to know about Satanism in the music industry. I know brothers and sisters who are addicted to what's going on with black people in Hollywood. I know brothers and sisters who are addicted to the Illuminati. I know brothers and sisters who are addicted to the black boule. Miss Miss Nomer, the black bourgeoisie, they are addicted to information. Just like you get addicted to crack and addicted to marijuana, all it does is make you high, but it doesn't take you nowhere. So I want to challenge the black community today to stop contenting yourself with information. Just because you know somebody's doing something, is it going to change it? Just because you know the Rockefellers created AIDS, that ain't going to change it. Just because you know Obama is a flunky for the Trilateral Commission, that ain't going to do nothing. Just because you know Africom is in Africa to recolonize Africa and steal its resources from its people, that's not going to change nothing. Just because you know that there's a black bourgeoisie operating in the United States of America that seeks to keep black people dumb, deaf, and blind in the service of Europeans and the American social order, just because we know doesn't mean a damn thing. We have to do something about it. People's lives are not protected with information. People's lives are protected with institutions. Um, how, can de- how, um, how can you determine if a child has learning disabilities? 
That's a good question. <laughs> Very good question, Princess. First of all, and I want all your listeners to hear me well, every psychological and psychiatric diagnosis is a professional opinion. I want you to remember that. Every psychological and every psychiatric diagnosis is a professional opinion. There is no way to objectively prove the presence of a learning disability. There is no way to objectively prove the presence of mental retardation. There is no way to objectively prove the presence of ADHD. There is no way to objectively prove the presence of an emotional disturbance. So how do we as psychologists come up with these labels? It's because we take the information that we gather from parents, from teachers, from children, from the different tests that we give, all of which are made by white people. And we take all this information, Princess, and we say, based upon this data, we suspect that there's a high likelihood, a great probability that you have a learning disability. Can we say we're sure? Hell no. We're never sure. It is a professional opinion. In the old days, up until 2004, you looked at a child's IQ score, and you compared the child's IQ score to their achievement score. And if your IQ was normal, meaning your intellectual ability was average or better, and your academic skills were low, they made the assumption that you had a learning disability just because your academic grades wasn't as high as your IQ was. I want people to hear that well, because anybody in America, any black child or adult who was diagnosed or is diagnosed with a learning disability, and if they earned that diagnosis prior to 2004, I want the listening audience to hear me well. If you have a child or you yourself was diagnosed with a learning disability up until 2004, special ed started in 1975. So from 1975 until 2004, if you were diagnosed with a learning disability, it is likely to be wrong. Why? Because look at the assumption that we're making. Look at the leap of faith that we're making. We're saying just because you have normal intelligence, and your reading scores are too low, or your math scores are too low, or your writing scores are too low, I'm going to assume that you have a learning disability. Now, why is that a problem, Princess? The reason it's a problem is because there's a lot of different reasons to account for why your reading scores are so low. There's a lot of different reasons to account for why your math scores are so low. There's a lot of different reasons to account for why you can't write as well. i give you some of the five most popular Differential diagnosis for learning disability. And when I say differential diagnosis, Princess, I'm talking about other factors that could explain the presence of the problem other than a learning disability. Number one, poor instruction. If a child has a teacher who can't teach or they go to a school that has a poor instructional program, guess what? The scores are going to be low. Number two, attendance. If you have a child who misses too much school because their parents could care less about their education or if they're constantly being suspended by the school principal, then they are being denied consistent instruction. And whenever you miss a class or two or three, whenever you're out the whole week on a five-day suspension for fighting, you miss an entire lesson on a new concept. So missing too much school by virtue of suspension or by virtue of Negro parents not taking you to school on time. So we're talking about attendance. We're talking about poor instruction. What's another reason why I find so many black children have grades beneath their grade level? The third reason has to do with unaddressed emotional and psychological problems. Understand, Princess, we live in a sick country and in a sick society, and we are a very sick people. And the reason we're sick is because we refuse to acknowledge that we continue to suffer from post-traumatic slavery disorders, the ramifications of enslavement, and because we don't want to accept the principal illness except uh, affecting black people, that illness compounds every other problem that we have. In other words, white people have economic problems, but black people have economic problems compounded by racism. White people have health problems, but black people have health problems compounded by racism. White kids are also being miseducated to some extent, but black kids are being miseducated deliberately because they're black. So every problem that we have in the black community is compounded by racism, which only adds 
to the stress and the hopelessness and the isolation produced by white supremacy. So now, another reason that could account for why test scores are low is because a lot of our children don't do no homework. I see kids come back and forth to school 180 days out of the school year and never have a book bag. They were never asked where their homework was. Their parents never asked them where their homework was. That's ridiculous for a black child to never do homework for most of the school year and not have the parent or teacher ask about it. And I'm getting sick and tired of people asking me why the white kids and the oriental kids perform better than the black kids. It's real simple. The Asian kids spend 15 hours a week studying outside of school. The white kids spend 12 hours a week studying outside of school. And the average black boy only spends about 45 minutes a week studying outside of school. So we got poor study habits. We got too much absenteeism. We got poor instruction. We got a deliberate miseducation system. And the other issue that I mentioned a second ago that I didn't finalize, and I apologize for that, unaddressed psychological issues. I was beginning to say that we live in an unhealthy society. And by virtue of living in an unhealthy society, princess, a lot of black children are dealing with divorce, molestation, rape, incest, bullying, homicide, suicide, homelessness, foodlessness, clothinglessness. Black children are catching hell in this country. In fact, black children are the poorest group of Americans in America. So when they come to school, they come to school hungry. When they come to school, some of our girls are still reeling from the molestation from the uncle or grandfather last night. Some of our boys are still reeling from the physical abuse of their father. Some of our children are still crying about the fact that mommy left dad or daddy left mommy or mommy and daddy was fighting. Some of them are still shaking from witnessing somebody get their brains blown out in front of them on their way to school. I had a child last year. I had a child who I evaluated last year, Princess, and I found out in my evaluation that this boy who lived in a housing project here in Philadelphia did not have a learning disability. He was not retarded, as the school thought. He was traumatized. And why was he traumatized? On his way to school one morning, guess what he saw? A dead black man laying in the middle of the street. Can you imagine being in the third or fourth grade, walking to school, and laying over there in the bushes on your way to school is a dead black man? I've never seen a dead black man in front of me, and I'm almost 37 years old. We're talking about a kid who's 9 or 10 years old. He was traumatized, but nobody gave him the therapy. He never got the attention that was deserved of him. So the first thing the school said is what? He needs special ed. I told everybody in a meeting, y'all, a bunch of damn fools. This boy ain't retarded, and he's not learning disabled. He suffered from trite psychological trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, as a result of seeing a deceased corpse of a black man. And now he believes that one day he may end up just like that black man. Give him some therapy. The last thing he needs is special education. So those are the five true reasons for why a lot of black children suffer. We don't need special education because special education was created as a strategy in the aftermath of the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision to resegregate black kids from white kids. Let me say it again. Special education was created to justify the resegregation of black children from white children because we can no longer say it's due to the color of their skin. We now say it's due to the presence of a learning disability that we can improve exists. It is nothing but madness. Do you know what children that you work with, um, do most of them celebrate so-called holidays like Memorial Day? Yes, they do. They celebrate Memorial Day right now, which is rather interesting. I don't have a problem with anybody paying respect to a deceased relative who died. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. My issue with Memorial Day is that you're celebrating in reality. You are celebrating the United States military's successes abroad, conquering, colonizing, and controlling African people. Memorial Day is a day set aside to celebrate people who died in the service of white supremacy. Now, if you want to pay respect to your individual relatives who died, I don't have a problem with that. For black people, I don't think it should be done on Memorial Day. We need to have our own holidays. But Memorial Day, remember, every holiday I agree. in a white supremacist system, every holiday in a white supremacist system 
serves the interests of the oppressor. Every single one, whether it's White Jesus, whether it's White Thanksgiving, or whether it's White Memorial Day, but a Memorial Day, which is one day that black people should not celebrate. Why? Because most of the wars that have been fought by this country and other countries were fought for the control of Africa. Nearly every war America ever fought in some way, shape, or form was fought to prevent somebody from getting strong enough to take Africa or to prevent someone who directly had an interest in controlling Africa. The only reason why the United States got involved in World War II to stop Adolf Hitler is because Hitler was moving on Africa. And whoever controls Africa controls the world. So if a black person is celebrating Memorial Day, they are celebrating the victories of white supremacy over black people beginning with slavery. Yeah, um, I uh, I totally agree of uh, what you said. Um, I am, like, uh, totally against um, uh, Memorial Day, um, any uh, white holiday. White holiday uh, meaning um, the uh, white people's um, holidays that, uh, yeah, uh, white people's um, holidays that uh, they make up. And, you know, um, I right. think no non-white person should, uh, and, and uh, I think a no non-white person should uh, celebrate um, or even, like, um, go with uh, white people's um, holidays, so-called holidays. That's correct. In fact, we have to realize something. You are always a slave to the people whose holidays you celebrate. You are always the slave to the people whose holidays you celebrate. If you celebrate Arab holidays, then you're a slave to Arab people. If you celebrate Jewish holidays, then you're a slave to Jewish people. If you celebrate American holidays, then you're a slave to American people. If you want to celebrate Chinese holidays, then you're a slave to Chinese people. If you notice, all self-respecting people celebrate their own holidays and only their own holidays. When's the last time you've seen a Chinese person with a St. Patrick's Day hat on? You've never seen a Chinese person with a St. Patrick's Day hat on. You know why? Because they're not Irish. But on St. Patrick's Day, you'll see millions of Negroes running around dressed in green and don't even know why they're dressed in green. You see, you'll never see an Arab, even if he's not a Muslim. You'll never see an Arab dressed up as Santa Claus. Why do you never see an Arab dressed up as Santa Claus? Because Santa Claus is an American cultural icon a fragment of someone's imagination. And no self-respecting people needs to celebrate the holidays of another people. Why? Because they have their own culture. But when you are a descendant of enslaved people, which means your culture has been stripped, you are looking for an identity. And guess what? Any identity will do, and you actually prefer the identity of your former slave master. Why? Because you have been taught to worship them in the first place. The reason black people love blue eyes and green eyes and blonde hair and white women and the reason why we have dogs as pets and everything else that we do isn't because white people do it. It's because white people have conquered us. You always follow the lead of he who has beaten you best. You always follow the lead of he who has beaten you best. If it was Asian people who were responsible for this total destruction of Africans, then we would be trying to look like Asian people. But because it was white folk, then we worship white folk. Black people are in love with white people, and that's why you have to be careful when you try to wake black people up. I, like I respect what Brother Gus is doing with this radio show because it's so very powerful. We need this. We need this. But on a one-on-one -on -one direct confrontation with the Negro in love with white people, you best get away from them because black people have been taught to love white people so much by their parents that a black person will kill you if you try to keep them away from white folks, which is why we have to recognize that all black people are not going to go along for this struggle. Everybody ain't going to be a part of the resurrection of Africa because many of their minds are so poisoned that they have reached a point of no return princess and they're no longer no good to us. What we have to do and what you have to do as you continue to grow up is you have to be able 
to determine who can be salvaged and who cannot be saved. You have to look at your brothers and sisters, your cousins, your uncles, your aunts, your next door neighbor, your coworkers, your classmates, people in your community, people in the race in general, and you have to have the wisdom to know who you can trust and who you can't. Because a lot of people who you think are sincere are turncoats. And a lot of people you think are turncoats might end up being your closest confidant in the struggle. So proceed with caution. Whenever I walk into a room, and this is something I have to do to protect my own self, because I'm the only psychologist out here that I know of who's really fighting the psychoacademic war against black boys. Dr. Kanjuku is fighting it, but he's not a psychologist. And most of our other psychologists are too in love with Egypt to spend their time doing anything else. But because I'm the only one, or there's probably some who I don't know yet, okay, but because I'm the principal warrior psychologist in the war against black children, when I go places, I scan the audience, I scan the audience. I'm scanning the audience to see which Negroes are there simply to cause confusion, to spy, to record, or to investigate for the CIA or the FBI. I have to know that, okay? And it doesn't alter anything that I'm going to say in my message, but it's good to know who is amongst your presence who's not necessarily for you, okay? It's very important that you learn to be able to determine what's on somebody's mind by looking at the facial expression, because one thing about black people, and psychology has proven this. Black people find it difficult to hide how they really feel, especially to other black people. So you can look at us and tell who don't like you, who's jealous, who's envious, who's going to try to bring you down. And I've perfected the art of determining who is my friend and who is my enemy before I even shake their hand. It's something you have to do in order to survive in this white war. Um... I just uh, wanted uh, um, yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, the problem is white people. Uh, um, my uh, next question uh, was, um, what are some suggestions of how to uh, deconfuse non-white children when? Uh, okay, my question is, what are some suggestions of how to deconfuse? non-white children about racism, white supremacy, when they have a white parent? Okay. Number one, I'm a Garveyite and a Pan-Africanist. And by virtue of that, any African who may have a white parent but who nonetheless identifies with the race is an African. Okay. So if a brother or a sister has a white mom or a white father, okay, I understand that they're referred to as mulattoes and more recently as biracial, but to Garveyites, Pan-Africanists, we don't make any distinction because none of us are responsible for how we got here. We have to recognize that many of the grandfathers of Pan-Africanism were also biracial. Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, who was the first black man to say that God was black, he was biracial. Okay, John Brown Westworm, the greatest of all the Pan-Africanists from Jamaica before Marcus Garvey, he gave us the first black newspaper, he was also the first black man to graduate from a college in this country. He was also the first black Pan-Africanist to go back to Africa, build up Africa, and die there. He did not have both two black parents. Only one was black. We look at Henry Sylvester Williams, who had the first Pan-African conference in 1900, who started the Pan-African newspaper. One of his parents was a European. I look at my ancestors, Frederick Douglass, as well as my great-great-great-great-grandfather, his brother, Stephen Henry Bailey, their mothers were raped by the slave master, so they were half white. So when I'm looking to see who I can trust in my struggle, it's not a matter of whether you have two black parents or one. If you have one black parent, which means the energy of our ancestors is running through your veins, and you identify with this race, and as far as I'm concerned, you are my brother. Take out the late great, look at the late great El Hajj, Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X, extremely fair skinned, okay? On his maternal side, they were Europeans. Do we reject Malcolm X because he had European blood? It's ridiculous. Why? Because if you are the descendant of an enslaved American, an enslaved African in America, nine times out of ten, you got some white blood somewhere in your line. So for me, it's a question of political consciousness, not color. For me, it's a question of political consciousness, not skin tone. Okay? Yes, we reject the participation of any non-African in our struggle. We don't want the help of nobody. Arabs, white people, Hispanics, no, this is an African movement. But we do not discriminate against Africans by virtue of the fact that they may have 
a little bit of white genotype floating around in their bloodstream. It's not up to them. If you got a black mother or black father, you identify with the race and you have proven yourself to be a soldier in the cause of African redemption, then you, my brother and sister. But I will admit, going back to your question, that a lot of mixed-race African people, not all, but a lot of mixed-race African people have had issues with their identity because they're half African and they're half European. And because of that, that creates a very serious internal conflict. But I want to be clear about something. The conflict is not the result of being biracial because for all of American history, up until the Tiger Woods and Barack Obama era, for all of American history, this society has been crystal clear. If you have a black parent, you are black. In fact, they even go any further. They say if you have one drop of black blood, which generally equated to one sixteenth, if you have one sixteenth African, so that means a great, 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 great grandparent was black, then you're black. That's how stringently Europeans attempted to keep their bloodline pure. Now, I don't go that far, okay? But my point is, there has never been any question as to who was black and who was not. That is a, a recent introduction into the social thought of America, and it was put there for one reason and for one reason only, to divide and conquer and to separate and rule, to make black people think that they could be accepted by white people by having a white parent. But as Barack Obama is learning right now, it doesn't matter even if you came out of a white womb, you are still a black man, and we're going to treat you like one. So the question ain't whether you can pass as white. The question ain't whether you can go around saying you're half white. In this country, if you have a black parent, you're black. And guess what? I agree with it. Thank you so much. Um, I don't uh, have any more questions uh, at this time for you, but uh, I will uh, later. Uh, go ahead, guys. Thank you, Princess. Thank you. Context of white supremacy. I was feeling a little bit of an echo. Okay, I don't hear it now. Um, again, our guest, uh, fifth visit to the context of white supremacy, Mr. Umar Abdullah Johnson. Um, I'm going to uh, <clears throat> I'm going to actually play a clip from Hidden Colors, because I think it makes a great point uh, that I want to get to. So this is the documentary film, uh, Hidden Colors, uh, Mr. Umar Abdullah Johnson. I was at a meeting last night with a group of parents who have children who are not being successful in high school. And at that meeting, there was a school member who said that she felt in the meeting, we were spending too much time discussing the problems, and that we hadn't begin to generate the solutions. And I told her that I disagree with her. And I explained to her why. I said one of the biggest problems we have as African people is that we are too quick to rush out and fix something you know nothing about. If the engine in my car is broke, and I'm not a mechanic, okay? And if I rush out to the car store and buy all types of fancy gadgets to get my engine running again, and I go up under that engine, Okay, I can end up wasting those resources, wasting time, wasting my money, and if I'm not careful, I could probably get killed under that hood not knowing what I'm doing. I got to be patient. I got to get that manual. I got to read through it. I got to study that system so once I get under that hood, I know exactly what to do, when and where. Problem with black folks is nobody is patient enough to investigate the problem fully to make sure we understand it so when we go out to fix it, we don't lose any lives unnecessarily, any resources unnecessarily, any time or money unnecessarily. Black. Context of white supremacy, again, from the documentary film Hidden Colors. Uh, I thought that was really important, and I hope that this program... Um, I hope that this program is, is touching exactly what you pointed to in that excerpt, and I was hoping that you could just elaborate on that a little bit, our confusion, and it seems worldwide, our worldwide confusion about what this problem is and the fact that we are at war with white people. Very much so. Um, as I said in that clip that you played there from Hidden Colors, black people suffer most from misinformation. And the problem 
is that the misinformation campaign, which is led by the media, who's controlled by the government, who are controlled by the economic forces, so the media is an arm of the American economic order, they deliberately put out tons of misinformation every day. Why do they do that? Because in order for you to fight and know when to fight and who to fight and where to fight them, you first got to find out where they are. But if you constantly put out misinformation, people have to spend hours, days, months, and years deciphering through the misinformation to try to find the morsel or grain of truth that they can stand on and use to strategize effectively with. So the biggest problem we have is the misinformation. I look at education. There's constantly, they're constantly putting out misinformation. Let me give you an example. The reason why it's so difficult for black parents to know what to do to fix the schools is because they're constantly told that, um, they're constantly told that there's not enough money in the schools. That's number one. We don't have enough money. That has nothing to do with the problem, brother Gus, but it's a what? Piece of misinformation. Then they'll say what? We don't have enough certified teachers. Brother Gus, that has nothing to do with the miseducation of black children. Money and the lack of certified teachers is irrelevant. What else do they say? We don't have proper resources. We don't have up-to-date books. We don't have new classrooms. We don't have new desks. We don't have new chalkboards. That has nothing to do with the miseducation of black children. But guess what? This is what they're telling us in the newspaper. This is on the Internet. It's on the TV shows. And then they get Negro educators and Negro psychologists to go out there and repeat this nonsense. And anything repeated constantly to the human brain is absorbed as a fact. Anything constantly repeated to the human brain is absorbed as a fact because the human brain is the creature of repetition. And so as a result of misinformation, it makes it so difficult for us to deal with our problems. For example, people are constantly telling black people in the political realm that the reason we don't get anywhere is because we don't vote Democrat. It has nothing to do with our problems. We don't get anywhere because we don't vote at all. It has nothing to do with our problems. We don't get anywhere because we don't back black candidates. Well, guess what? The black candidates are controlled by the white candidates. So you see, the misinformation keeps black people stagnated because they don't know who to believe. See, you have the masses of black people in the middle, Brother Gus. This is like a tug of war. You have the masses of black people in the middle, okay? They represent 80% of the race in this country. 40 million blacks, 80% are politically ignorant. They might have doctorate degrees, but they're politically ignorant. They might have a lot of money, but they're politically ignorant. Okay, I want to make sure we understand that. That political ignorance ain't got nothing to do with your formal education because your formal education is nothing but a training. It was not an education at all. I got five college degrees. I've been to some of the best universities on the East Coast. And guess what? It is nothing but a training. So anyhow, you've got the ignorant masses in the middle. They represent the 80%. Then you have, to the right, holding the tug-of-war rope, is the 15% black aristocracy which is often called the bourgeoisie. And, of course, I don't use bourgeoisie, and we already talked about that, and that's because black people don't own anything. Class and bourgeoisie means you control resources. They don't control any resources. So you have the 15% bourgeoisie on the right trying to pull for control of the masses. Who's pulling on the other side? The 5% of us who represent the so-called black conscious or black revolutionary community. So we want control of the masses. The problem is we're the smallest group. The masses are 80%. The black aristocracy, the untalented tenths, the elitist Negroes, they're 15, and we just five. And to make it even worse, to help the 15% out, the United States government does what? Give them legitimacy, give them status, give them money, give them access to the airways, access to the radio. So not only are we already outnumbered, but then the American social order provides them with resources so that they can do what? Win the trust and mind of the masses. And to make it even worse, to make it even worse, Brother Gus, is that the five of us who represent the conscious community, all we have to our credit is information. So the people are looking for food, clothing, and shelter. They're not getting it from the 15%, but they think they can get it from the 15%. Now, guess what? They would leave the 15% and come to us, but we ain't got nothing for them. 
All we got is information. Somebody come to us talking about, I need a place to stay. I need some food to eat. I need a job. We want to baptize them. We want them to take their shahada. We want them to become a Moor. We want them to become a Hebrew. We want them to become a Garvey. We want them to become a this. We want them to become a that. Ain't nobody fed nobody. Ain't nobody housed nobody. Ain't nobody clothed nobody. But we want them to accept ideology. All we got is information and ideology. What good is information and ideology without a house to go with it? Without a job to go with it? Without a decent lifestyle to go with it? So we're losing because we're content with the information and the ideology. Now, how was Malcolm, excuse me, how was Marcus Garvey and Elijah Muhammad and the Black Panthers able to get the 80% away from the 15%? By building institutions. The people are going to go to wherever they're cared for. The people are going to go to whomever cares for them. If we want the masses, then we've got to stop talking about information and ideology and make sure we feed, clothe, and house them. And once you feed, clothe, and house a hungry, naked, and homeless black man, he will swallow all the information and ideology that you have. Our problem is we don't have nothing to give our people, and then we got a nerve to get mad when they don't listen to us. Misinformation is the enemy. And that's why to tell the truth is one of the most revolutionary things we can do, Brother Gus. What you do, what I do, what the other brothers and sisters do, tell the truth. To tell the truth in the midst of white racism, knowing what the risks are, is one of the most revolutionary things you can do. Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, who started the religion of Islam, said that the pen is mightier than the sword. The Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, who gave us the largest black organization in modern history, said yes. The pen is mightier than the sword, but the tongue is mightier than them both. The one thing about the voice, the one thing about oratory, the one thing about radio and television, Brother Gus, is that it takes the words that somebody might read in a newspaper or a magazine and put spirit to them. You can read somebody's book, but to hear them talk the words that are in that book live are going to give you a totally different impression, which is why we have to to tell the truth and let the chips fall with amen. Context of white supremacy. I want to make sure I give out the uh, call-in number. Uh, folks out there, if you want to dial in to ask a question, uh, you can dial in the number 760 Seven six, and then the code is five six four nine four three pound. Uh, number one more time is seven six zero five six nine seven six seven six, and the code is five six four nine four three pound. Um, and this information, if you're listening at TalkShoe, uh, it's, it's written there, so you can get all that info if you missed it, uh, so you can dial in to ask a question. Um, next question, actually, I have another sound clip um, I can bring from Hidden Colors. Again, highly recommend uh, folks check it out. This is, uh, once again, uh, Umar Abdullah Johnson, and uh, I think he has touched on this point prominently already in the program. The issue with black people is this. We hate who we are and love who we can be. We hate who we are, Africans, and love who we can be, Europeans. We do not want anybody to remind us of who we are, which is why we shun Africa. We are trying to get out of who we are. And we think that if we act white enough and marry white enough and dye our hair white enough, then maybe white folks will start treating us like white folks. You are an African. White people have never forgotten it, no matter how much you try to, and you will always be treated like an African. It doesn't matter how many doctors you got. It doesn't matter how light you are. It doesn't matter if your wife is white. You can ask Tiger Woods about that. You will still be treated like a black person. Context of white supremacy. Um, that issue, you know, constantly pops up on the program. Uh, I think, as I said, it has come up several times uh, in the broadcast already. Um, and I have taken the position that uh, this is a major 
uh, part of the problem with regards to why we have not replaced white supremacy with justice in terms of uh, Let's have sexual intercourse with white people. That That's a good thing. That represents progress. Uh, I have taken the position that we should not be doing that at all. It's one of the worst things that can happen to a non-white person. Uh, and that I think part of our programming is that we believe consciously and or unconsciously having sex with a white person, having a child with a white person, that will help solve the problem. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, yes, sir. I very much agree with you. We sort of realized something, and I think Dr. Nilly fully touched the book on this on his, in his compensatory code book, and that is the race who is in control is always in control, even when they don't appear to be. When a black man sleeps with a white woman, because he's the male and she's the female, he may appear that he's in control of that sexual relationship, that engagement, that marriage, that romantic relationship, what he fails to realize is that she belongs to the race that rules. And because he belongs to the race that rules, nothing he can do can overstep the power that she is invested with by being a white woman. At any second, at any second, any white woman married to a black man right now can pick up the phone, call the police, yell, rape, and destroy their lives. Right this very moment, right this very moment, okay? If she wanted to take him to court and destroy his life and take half of his earnings, she could do it a whole lot more successfully than any black woman could do. If she wanted him removed out of the house right now, they would drag his black ass out of that house. Now, if a black woman called and she wanted her husband out the house, she could probably get him out, but it's not going to be easy. But when a white woman calls the white police to get a black man out of the house, his ass is out. And, they, and we fail to realize that power is power. It doesn't matter if it's vested in a woman. It doesn't matter if it's vested in the man. I mean, look at Michael Jackson when he was spending all the time with those little white boys and their family made them cry rape. Okay, whether he did it or not, okay, it's secondary to the point that I'm making. The point that I'm making is that some white children accuse the top-selling musician in American history of attempting to molest them. And by virtue of that, his career was destroyed. Sony deliberately destroyed his last album, Invincible, which ultimately led to him doing the concerts to raise enough money to pay off his debt. And then they killed him right before he went on tour so they could take back the Elvis and um, Beatles catalogs. So again, white folks are in power. And because they are in power, me personally, Brother Gus, not that I have any reason to be around them anyway, but when I'm working in the public schools, of course, mostly white women, I'm never alone with them, don't want to be alone with them, because I'll be damned if you're going to say anything about me to destroy the work that I'm trying to do. And I have to be particularly careful, because they will love nothing more than to shut up Umar Johnson. They will love nothing more than to shut up Umar Johnson. So I don't want to be alone with a white woman. Okay, I ain't got no reason to be alone with a white man, and I don't want to be alone with a white child. I'm shutting away, kid. If someone comes by and shut it and say, and boy, you should shut this door. No, you're not going to open that door because I'm here with a white child. And I'm not going to give them the power to destroy who I am. Black people ain't got no business to be like people like that. The power, we don't. What's going to get me? You're having sex with white women thinking you can't be that. Ridiculous thing you can do. You can never get back at white people by having sex with his woman. Why? Because the only white women out to have sex with, I said the only white women that black men are allowed to have sex with are white women that no other white man wanted. Wow. Wow. Context of white supremacy. Uh, I hope people got that, you know, clearly. I wanted the silence to hang for emphasis. I believe you said uh, it is uh, absurd to think that having sexual intercourse with a white person is some form of vengeance uh, or some means of combating the system of white supremacy. Did I did I hear that correctly? Yes, sir. OK. Um, in a very much, in my opinion, uh, related subject matter, um, 
This was posted on Thursday, and I just wanted to get your thoughts. Uh, social engineering, I feel like, like this is your fifth visit to the cows. We should be a little more informed about your views. Uh, social engineering and anything they start, they finish. Um, this was in the uh, May 26th uh, Life Life. It, uh, LifeNews.com. Uh, I can post it on the Facebook page for folks if you want to check it out. The name of this news article is UN Advisor. Nigerians must not exceed maximum of three children per family. And it has a photograph of a person I think is white. Uh, and it says, figures released by the United Nations Population Fund earlier this month projected Nigeria's population to skyrocket from 160 million this year to 730 million by two, uh, 2100, behind only India and China. In the wake of these seemingly staggering figures, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs, looks like a white person, special advisor to the UN Secretary General, expressed his alarm calling for huge population control methods in the western excuse me west african country uh, i just wanted to get your thoughts i think this show, world system of white supremacy i mean this it touches on a lot i just wanted to get your thoughts very much so if you remember a couple shows back we talked about the effort to reduce the black population, which began in the 70s. Most of the global population control organizations, agencies, and initiatives skyrocketed in growth in the 1970s. That's when homosexuality was introduced as a normal form of behavior, meaning that it was taken out of the DSM diagnostic code homosexuality used to be a diagnosable condition. It was removed in 1973 by the American Psychiatric Association after pressure was put on them by the um, Rockefeller World Population Council as well as Planned Parenthood. That was in uh, 1973. In 1974, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger put together the NSSM, National State Security Memorandum 2000, or 200, excuse me, that deliberately focused on population control, where he talked of sex education, which was a code word for homosexual education, as a way to reduce the black growth rate. As I'm constantly telling black people, and I'm telling them again right now, homosexuality has nothing to do with nurture and nature. It's about racial extermination. If you can influence black school children to cohabitate with children of the same gender, if you can influence boys to spend their life with boys, and if you can influence black girls to spend their lives with black girls, you don't have to worry about conception. Preventing black conception through homosexuality is infinitely more beneficial than AIDS, police brutality, mass incarceration, or AIDS, police brutality, incarceration, and homicide. You have to first went to the life is here in order to destroy it. You have the first thing with the whole you better go. No one gets killed. Nobody has any more money to create the AIDS population. All you have to do is get black people, black boys to sleep with black boys, and black girls to sleep with black girls, and you cut the black population rate in half. Now, Henry Kissinger's document. NSM 200, published in 1974, the year I was born, and one year before they created special education, which I would also consider a population control reduction through miseducation. Now, in his document, Brother Gus, he listed, and this is 1974. This is 19. In his document, Brother Gus, he listed several African countries who needed to be deliberately targeted by the State Department the United Nations, the World Population Council, for population reduction. And guess which one of those states you just named was on that list? Nigeria. Nigeria was picked 
as one of the fastest growing nations in 1974, Brother Gus, a nation that the government and the World Population Council and the United Nations needed to directly target to reduce their numbers. What you just read is nothing more than an increased strategy to try to reduce Nigeria's numbers because Global 2000, which was started in the early 70s by Jimmy Carter, has not proven totally successful. Global 2000 was supposed to reduce. Global 2000 was supposed to reduce the black population on the continent by 50% by the year. As you can see, we continue to grow. AIDS is killing black folk. It is, but it ain't slowing down the population. Those specific countries that Henry Kissinger talked about, Nigeria being but the reason why they want to reduce Nigeria, Brother Gus, isn't purely because it's numerically the largest population on the continent. Nigerians are also some of the proudest Africans on the continent. They're some of the most upstanding, some of the most courageous Africans on the continent. They're not the only ones. Okay, but they are very, very self-assured. Nigeria also has what? Some of the largest untapped oil and gas resources in the world. So this just ain't about numbers. It's about having the numbers to successfully defend your own natural resources. Context of white supremacy, uh, gusty renegade and justice, uh, fifth visit to the cows, uh, nationally certified school psychologist, Mr. Umar Abdullah Johnson. Um, I was actually, I had a few more questions, but I thought I would go ahead and check since a lot of folks did call in to see if they have uh, questions they would like to ask. Um, let's see, I'll check. Uh, let's see, person called in from Southern California and picking up some background noise. <laughs> if I'm, uh, I'm going to check the phone lines. If you all could kind of watch the background noise, that would be uh, helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see, I'll try again. Let's see. New York, person that called in from New York and the person that called in from California. Did either of you two have a question for Umar Abdullah Johnson? Hi, I'm the caller from California. Thanks for letting me speak. I have a question for Mr. Johnson, if I may. Um, I, I'll make it real quick. I have a son. He goes to school. Um, his teacher called me, told me he was a prodigy. Uh, like maybe 50 times in one phone call and also said that he was uh, a genius several times in, this, in one phone call that had nothing to do with that, so I thought. And I was a little leery about it because she was saying maybe I should, uh, she wanted to follow him and she could help me. She's not, she's not Caucasian, she's Spanish. But she has like blonde hair, you know. But anyway, she wants to, to help me with him and do all this stuff and uh, all this stuff, just everything she wants to she wants to follow him after he gets out of elementary school. And to make it real quick, my question is: Should I be a little leery about that? Because he he's he's cool. He's carried the school though. He's the school seven nineteen percent black, seventy percent Spanish, and a, a drop of this and that uh, afterwards. But he carries the school literally. I uh, teach him that school is business and you gotta get in there and get 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 in there and get out. So he's he's on it. So he carries the school. I'm a little concerned about her following him. I don't know what they're trying to, I just don't understand. I'm wondering if you think that I should be a little concerned about how she's so serious about my son. To answer the question, I think you should be very concerned. Um I've worked at hundreds of schools. I've done thousands of evaluations. Uh, I know thousands of teachers, and I've never once heard of a teacher wanting to follow a student after they leave not only their classroom, but leave the school. I don't understand why she would want to continue contact with a child well after he's left the grade and left the school. I don't understand that. Now, if there's some type of program that she wants to enroll him in that she thinks he may benefit from, then that needs to be made known. 
Uh, I don't know how old your son is. Maybe that would clarify things. If he's older, maybe like in his teen years in high school, then I would be really leery because we have a big situation of teachers, including females, sleeping with our high school boys and our high school girls. So you should be particularly concerned if he's in high school or middle school. But if he's in elementary school, why would she want to follow him for the next seven, eight, nine, ten years? It makes no sense. But I would go ahead. I thought she said something else. Uh, as far as him being a genius, I think you need to get him tested for mentally gifted. It sounds like he might be mentally gifted. If she's saying he's that intelligent, and I believe he is, I think you need to write a letter to the school and request that he be tested for giftedness. Uh, if he's at a private school where they're not necessarily required to test for giftedness, you can still get him tested for free through his local public school that he would have been attending had he not been at the private school, or you can pay for your own private gifted evaluation, which might be your best bet since a lot of white psychologists are not comfortable diagnosing black kids as gifted. Um, the person that called in from New York, the person that called in from New York and the person that called in from Massachusetts, did either of you two have a question? Uh, New York, Massachusetts, did either of you have a question? Can I be heard? Yes, sir. The caller from Massachusetts, um, greetings, everyone. Um, my question was, um, or first my statement, um, before um, I became more informed about racism and white supremacy, um, I was having a hard time just with dealing with certain things with school, and my behavior was a little out of whack. So I went to go see a therapist, and they basically diagnosed me as being bipolar. Um, have you ever diagnosed any of um, the kids with that that you've seen, or do you have any information in regards to how bipolar um, is just another tool that they're using against us? Uh, well, all psychiatric diagnoses are handcuffs. All psychiatric diagnoses are handcuffs, and you have to be careful because they become a permanent part of your medical record. And under certain laws, in certain states, for certain professions, if you're diagnosed with a mental disorder, which is what they are called, including bipolar, everything from bipolar to schizophrenia to depression to ADHD, you can be restricted from actually being employed in certain professions. Now, bipolar has become the ADHD for adults and for children. Uh, there's a lot of debate over whether or not you should even be diagnosing children with bipolar um, because, to be honest, a, child, a child's emotional regulation is not really as mature as an adult's. So any child can look like they're bipolar going from manic behavior to depressive behavior because they're children, and to some extent, that's normal. Okay, for an adult, we should have much better regulation of our emotional state. But again, bipolar is a very superficial diagnosis that I see is being given to any black person, any black person who comes in for a psychological or psychiatric evaluation, and if they don't know what your situation is, if they can't come up with a clean and appropriate diagnosis, they slap you with bipolar. In fact, I had a conversation with some white colleagues about a year or two ago on this very issue of bipolar. And they were talking about white folks. And the issue, it was a discussion in one of my grad classes, the issue is why is everybody being diagnosed with bipolar? It's like the label. Just like every black boy gets diagnosed with ADHD because they don't know what else to do with them, every black person, adult, is being diagnosed with bipolar because they don't know what else to do with them. Bipolar really is just an emotional dysregulation. Uh, it is the inability or unwillingness to be able to control one's emotional state, causing you to go from one pole to the other, from depression to happiness or from mania to sadness, you know, in seconds and minutes with almost uh, no kind of a warning and no type of control. Uh, understand this. With most psychiatric diagnoses, they are given so that you can be given a prescription. So if you are not someone who's for drugs, I really don't see what the benefit of the diagnosis is. 
Uh, I mean, if someone really does have bipolar, and again, you may have it, but you may also be at risk of having them misdiagnosed with it because, again, they give it to anybody black. Okay, that's, that's the label for adult black people. You know, your best bet is to find your good therapist. You can go to the Association of Black Psychologists website, ABSI, A-B-P-S-I dot org, and get the phone number or email address for the representative for your particular state. Call them and see if they have any therapy contacts in your area. Therapy is the way to go. We don't need medicine. Sometimes the therapist has to diagnose you in order to get paid. That's the way capitalism gets rich off black people's mental problems. You have to diagnose as a therapist if you want to get reimbursed from the medical company. So sometimes you have to go that route, but get the therapy. You don't need the pills. Uh, they're pushing the pills because you'll be on pills forever because pills don't solve your problems. Pills don't solve. Pills suppress. And as a result of that, it's best to go with the therapy. Therapy might take a couple years or a couple months. Pills, you'll be on them forever. And by the time you get off, you have so many other problems that you probably end up being worse than what you were in the first place. But bipolar is the new ADHD. They give it to anybody black. Person that called in uh, guest 14, guest 14, and the guest uh, from Southern California. Did either of you two have a question for Umar Abdullah Johnson? Uh, yes, I do, for Mr. Uh, Abdullah. I have a question. You mentioned um, uh, Nigeria has natural resources. And I was wondering, how, they, how are they to defend their natural resources? Can that be heard? I, I, I can hear you. Um, let see. Uh, Umar, are you still with us? I'll put myself on mute. Okay. Uh, let's see. Showing that he's still here. Uh, Umar, can you hear us? Hmm. Uh, that is interesting. Um, I will attempt. Okay. Okay. I'll try and I'll try and dial him. Try and dial him back. See if we can get it back on the line. Umar Johnson. Yes, sir. We got disconnected. Uh, Sorry, sir. Yes, sir. I was still on, but my mute button was accidentally hit by my face because I have a touch screen, and I was trying to unmute it so I could hear you guys, but you couldn't hear me. My apologies. No, no worries at all. Okay. Uh, did you hear the, the gentleman's question? Yes, about... I did. Oh, okay. Yes, I did. The problem with Africa, to answer his question, the problem with Africa is that it doesn't have a standing army. None of the 54-plus nations of Africa has a standing army that can compete with any of the global economic powers. The army of Africa can't compete with China, they can't compete with Europe, and they can't compete with America. They can't compete with Russia. And because of that, Africa is like a lame duck. It is a prize to be won by all of the other European and Asian countries of the world who are aggressive enough and economically developed enough to be able to stake a claim in Africa and defend it militaristically. One of the biggest problems with Africa is it has sat by and done absolutely nothing but beg for assistance from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. You know, Africans have kept themselves defenseless, dangerously defenseless, and now that they have allowed AFRICOM to come into the country, that's the worst thing that they could have done. They have let this house Negro Barack Obama come into Africa, set up military bases, and so, done, and so now if they ever decide that they don't want to give the West their resources at these ridiculously cheap dollar store prices, then they will simply do what? Create a terrorist, say that Nigeria is harboring al-Qaeda, say that Niger or uh, uh, Sierra Leone or Botswana is harboring al-Qaeda, and then they will use the so-called terrorist motive to do what? Go into Africa, kill thousands of our brothers and sisters so they can take control of the resources. The worst thing that has happened to Africa, I would say, since the end of colonialism, has been Barack Obama. Barack Obama's AFRICOM was the worst thing to hit Africa. The problem is black people in America don't care because they don't care about Africa. So when you talk about AFRICOM and Obama putting AFRICOM in Africa, which is basically the recolonialization of the continent, 
the average black person don't care because he doesn't care about Africa. But for Obama to have done that probably makes him one of Africa's greatest enemies of all time. But to answer the brother's question, Africa is in no position to defend its national resources. And that is our standing disgrace as the people. Because there's no group of black people on earth, not in America, not in the Caribbean, not in Asia, not in Africa, there's no group of Africans now who literally could go to the other European or Asian powers of the world. And that is why we get no respect. The Honorable Marcus Barr said that a strong man is strong everywhere. A strong man is strong everywhere. Cannot and only be as strong as your country prepared to defend you. You can be as strong to the blacks in the community. They have blacks. Uh, you're breaking up a little bit. Okay. We should be good to go. Uh, we still have our guests with us. Yeah, it, uh, it, it was breaking up a little bit um, when you were finishing up with your response about how uh, the continent of Africa is not really in position to defend itself. Okay. Am I being heard? Yes, I can hear you, Brother Gus. It's okay. Brother Umar. Okay. Okay. I, I was talking. I wasn't heard. Then I got disconnected again. Um, what I attempted to say, it's, we're having some phone difficulties today, and it seemed like a lot of it started when uh, the sex question came up. Um, at any rate, um, I was saying that it was there was some uh, interference about the last sentence of the response when the gentleman asked this question about defending Africa, and you were saying that Africa is in a tough position um, right now. It's kind of a lame duck. And I, I was just hoping if you could kind of give him the last sentence uh, when you were concluding uh, sure. your response. Sure. I uh, had said that the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey had warned us that if we were not prepared, you know, his watchword was be prepared. He said that if we were not prepared, we would be taken advantage of. Uh, you have to have a strong military foundation. You have to have a strong educational foundation. And you have to have a strong economic foundation. You need other things, but those three things are critical. Why? Your educational system prepares your children. Your educational system prepares your children to participate in this struggle. Your economic system allows you to provide for your people. And your military system allows you to protect your people. You have to provide, you have to protect, and you have to teach. Those are the three institutions that every powerful nation has, and Africa does not have all three in any one country simultaneously. We don't have a militaristic system. And that's why I think the Pan-African Prisoner Repatriation Project that I'm going to be working on with the prison system is going to be key because a lot of those brothers behind bars were in the military, they had the technological know-how to make weapons, to break down weapons, to teach brothers and sisters in Africa how to use advanced machinery in military warfare. So that's why that's going to be key. But, the, you know, going back to the brother's question, Africa isn't able to defend itself. Okay, I think we got that one clear. Um, let's see. Oh, and I did. I also wanted to make sure that I got out uh, because we had uh, – seems racist white supremacist presence in the chat room during yesterday's broadcast uh, that today in the chat room I saw one of the handles was you breed like roaches that was one of the handles and the other was I love being white that was the other so you know just to let you know that white people are watching they are doing their recon as expected um, Person uh, Angel Star, Angel Star, and Southeast Pennsylvania. Did either of you two have a question? Yes, I'd like to know. This is uh, Marcella from Philadelphia, and I would like to know how capital could be raised to institute educational um, schools and other forms of learning um, organizations in our community. 
Okay. Actually, it's not a difficult thing to do, and I'll tell you why. Black people in America are the richest group of Africans on the face of the earth, and we are the 10th richest population in the world. There's only nine groups of people who gross more money than black people who live in America, and none of them are black. So we have more disposable income than any other group of Africans on the face of this earth. And you can see this. Uh, you drive through the black community, you'll see cable. Everybody has cable. Everybody has a, a, a DVD player, television, high-definition TV, Xbox, video game, expensive clothes, expensive hair. The problem is we don't want to spend none of our disposable income as a sacrifice to put forward the greater good of the race. See, we have the money to fix our own problems, and this is principally why we don't get sympathy from other races. This is why we don't get sympathy from other nations of Africans throughout the world, because they pick it up and they say, those people got the money to build their own schools, to build their own factories, to create their own infrastructure, but they simply refuse to do it because we're still operating like slaves. Only a slave can be content being dependent on his master, and only black people can be content dependent on white folks. So we can do it. But again, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think black people are ready to sacrifice their money for the greater good of the race. I say it every time I speak in public. I tell people, you guys will come out to hear me. Hundreds of people, you know, will come out to hear me speak. But if I told those hundreds of people to come back the next day with $100, not even 20% of them would be there. And of the 20% who come back with $100, they won't be back to following me with another $100. Like I said, we are content with information and ideology. We do not want to use our income to build institutions. Let me say it again. The chief problem of black America is that we are content with information and having an ideology, but we do not want to use our income to build institutions. Let's see. Um... Angel Star, Angel Star, and Northeast California. Did either of you two have a question? Let's see. Um, Prism and East Louisiana. Did either of you two have a question? Uh, Prism, East Louisiana. Uh, the person that called in from New York, did you have a question? Okay. Uh person that called in from Texas, did you have a question? Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, we can hear you, sir. Oops. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you, sir. Okay. Uh, Brother Omar, I have a question for you. Uh, my daughter is 11 years old. She's in the fifth grade, and she's been in the honors class as long as she's been in school. One thing that we've noticed this year particularly, has, uh, and she's feeling a bit discouraged because uh, in her classroom, in the beginning of the semester, there was an Asian student, a uh, so-called Japanese young man, and her, and they were the top students, consistently getting 95 and 98s on their tests. And this young boy uh, didn't even speak English, so what the other kids would tease them, tease the young boy because he didn't speak English, but he obviously did what he needed to do to get good grades. He was an exchange student, and uh, he left to go back to Japan with his family. Now, my daughter consistently gets 95 and 100s on all her tests, and they're constantly trying to pit her against a young white girl who gets about 80s and 85s on her tests. So whenever there is any uh, affirmation or whoever's got the highest grade, they always lump in this young white girl. And she constantly says, well, why do they put her in it? And she gets at least 10 or 15 points less than me. So what do I do as a parent? By, and I'm 
I make sure that I talk to her about racism constantly. But what do I do as a parent to help her deal with this on a day-to-day basis? For instance, this week she got a uh, science project, and they suggested that she look up scientists and whoever had a, a particular theory or on a particular thing, and every scientist that they gave her was white. But they said you could look at what, sorry, whatever scientist that you wanted to. So, of course, I took her to the library and we found some black scientists. Now, I'm concerned that the moment that she begins bringing out all this black information and there's going to be a bit of a back, backlash. So what do you suggest? Okay. Well, number one, the good news is the school year is ending. So we really don't have to do much as it relates to this year because she'll be in a different grade with a different teacher next year. If the problem starts again, I think I would have to speak to the administration. I would have to have a conversation with the principal uh, to see why she's constantly being grouped with a child who doesn't perform as well as she does. Why can't she receive individual recognition? Why does she also have to be lumped in with this white girl? I would have to speak with the principal. If it continues, I would have to take it up to the superintendent. And if it continues after that, you can go into the State Department of Education. Ultimately, you could go to the uh, Human Relations Commission and also up to the United States Department of Education. So there's a lot of steps we can take. But again, you know, you want to build your daughter's self-esteem. You want to teach her about racism, not to be angry or to hate anyone, but to understand it. So, you know, you're going to continue to do that because, as you said, you already are doing that. I would just continue to encourage her. Uh, You may also want to uh, consider just not having her receive uh, these types of adulations in front of the classroom as regularly as she receives them. In other words, if she knows she's better than the child, and is content knowing she's better without actually being singled out as being better, then I would simply tell the teacher that my daughter no longer needs to be recognized in the class unless she can be recognized as being the top performer in the classroom. Sometimes it's better to just pull out of that whole recognition piece altogether. And I've known parents to do that. They simply tell the teacher, since this ain't fair, my daughter doesn't need to be recognized by you, she'll be recognized by me. Okay? And that also teaches her not to rely on white people for approval because, you know, we got a bad habit of relying on white folk for approval. If she knows she's intelligent, she can get that recognition from you through the National Junior Honor Society through other types of programs in the city that award high-achieving African-American children or high-achieving children in general. So that's something you might want to consider. I don't know how far you are from Austin, Texas, but I'll be speaking in Austin, Texas on Saturday, June the 11th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Greater Calvary Church and Abundant Life Learning Center at 6510 Berkman Drive in Austin, Texas, Saturday, July 11th at 10 a.m. If you are close, please come on out because there will be a lot of good information that uh, I'm sure you can benefit from raising your daughter as well as any other Africans in the state of Texas. This will be my first time coming. Hmm. Uh, let's see. The person that called in from uh, East Maryland, a uh, person that called in from – oh, I'm echoing. I'm echoing. Please no speakerphone. A uh, person that called in from East Maryland and the person that called in from Texas. Did either of you two have questions? Oh, okay. assume they did not. Did either of you all have questions? Greetings. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Greetings to you, Gus, Justice, Dr. Johnson, as well as the callers and the listeners on the line. I greatly appreciate and I do enjoy when you come on the show because you give a lot of informative and very relevant information. And one of the things that you mentioned earlier when you were speaking about with what's going on with the African continent and with us as a group and not being the coalition, one thing that you have to, um, a couple things to quickly keep in mind is that we, women and children are always used as scapegoats in the educational process when these so-called superpowers are using it as an excuse in order to invade a land. Because one of the excuses that they always use is that the women are oppressed, the women are not being educated, and therefore we need to go in and all, relieve them of their suffering and bring education to them, which is always a ruse because it never happens. And we've seen this happen continuously. It happened in Afghanistan, Iraq and they're going to try and do the same thing on Nigeria in order to go in and split that country up into three sections. Once again, the Christian, the Muslims, and the other tribal section in order for them to manage it because they cannot manage Nigeria as a whole big country 
but they're going to split it up into workable factions and have them go against each other while the European superpowers come in there and try and do what they have to do. So I do appreciate you said that you're going to be in town. I'm in the Dallas Fort Worth area. You said you're going to be in the Austin area. I'll listen to you again on the end and get your information because I have some nephews that are in the school system here in Texas, and I will definitely pass this information on to their parents so that they can definitely make that trip to even that you're going to be getting in July. So thanks again for listening in and for you know allowing me to ramble through as I did. No problem. Thank you. Let's see, uh, caller uh, in East Maryland and Southern California. Did either of you have questions? Uh, picking up a lot of background noise. Picking up a lot of background noise. Um, caller sixty four. Did you have a question? Caller 64, did you have a question? Okay. I will check the uh, free HD line as well. Uh, folks can dial in over there. Uh, let's see. Non Mighty Wick. Uh, non Mighty Wick, did you have a question? Okay. Uh, let's see. Person who dialed in last four digits 7531. 7531, did you have a question? Okay. I'm assuming they're just listening. A uh, person who called in last four digits, 3413. 3413, did you have a question? Uh, no, I don't, but uh, thanks again, and I'm enjoying the show. Groovy. A uh, person that called in uh, with uh, their Skype handle, person that called in with their Skype handle. Did you have a question? Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, good night, everyone. Um, uh, my question for Brother Umar is, how you doing, Brother Umar? Peace, brother. Okay. Um, my question is, uh, I was actually in a, in, um, I'm calling from Louisiana, and uh, I was in a, at the Congo Square. I don't know if you're familiar with the Congo Square in Louisiana. But it's um yeah, it's yeah. an area yeah where, where Africans gather every Sunday. There's a drum circle there, and uh, someone raised a question about the black community, the black conscious community, alienating uh, homosexuals that are, are black revolutionaries. Also, now um it's my my uh, my firm belief that homosexuality is a uh, like anti-sexual behavior and kind of counterproductive to to our revolution and, and black liberation. Now, I wanted to get your take on that. Basically, um, is there a role for gay black people who are who want to play a part in the in the black revolution, but they they feel alienated from the black conscious community? Okay. Good question. Okay. Number one, number one, we have to recognize that any behavior that is counterproductive to the interests of African people cannot be condoned within the struggle. Any behavior that is contrary to the best interests of our people cannot be condoned within the struggle. Homosexuality is a form of genocide. Homosexuality is a form of genocide. Only one out of every four black women will get married in her lifetime. Only one out of every four. That means that 75% of our women will never have husbands, which means 75% of them will never have their own family. We cannot allow black men and women to further reduce that potential of getting married, to further destabilize the black community and the black family by practicing a behavior that prevents the proliferation of our people. So I cannot tolerate homosexual participation within the struggle because the very act is a contradiction 
because you are engaging in genocidal behavior while at the same time trying to fight genocide. How can you fight genocide when you are engaging in genocidal behavior? When a man spends his life with a man, there's no children. When a woman spends a life with, other, with another woman, there's no children. And even if they adopt, even if they adopt, you are instilling anti-African values in the adopted African children. So now they grow up confused, believing that that type of a relationship is in the best interest of our people, which it's not. And thusly, they continue to pollute, pollute the intellectual culture of black people with this homosexual behavior. So no, I cannot condone their participation in the struggle as long as they practice a genocidal form of behavior. Do I respect their humanity? They are my brothers and my sisters, and I love them. But they are suffering from mental illness. They are suffering from a mental illness. And until they cure that mental illness, they cannot participate in the struggle. Mm. Um, I wanted to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to double check. Um, Justice, did you have any other questions you wanted to ask Umar Abdullah Johnson? Um, yes, I do. Um, uh, I uh, just uh, wanted to point out, uh, Jeannie, uh, irritated Jeannie, um, works for uh, Homeland Security. Um, I have a few questions. Is Homeland Security the same as the police and the FBI? Okay. Let me say this respectfully. Um, I consider the irritated Jeannie a friend and a colleague in this struggle. And I think that one of the things we have to recognize and understand in this war we have against white supremacy is that in any war, in any war that you have, you have to be able to gather intelligence behind enemy lines. To be successful, you have to be able to gather intelligence behind enemy lines. For example, as a psychologist, I go into the public school system every day in an attempt to gather information about what they are doing to further miseducate, marginalize, and destroy our black boys. Now, by working in the public school system, although I work for myself and I'm in private practice, but by working in the public school system, does that make me a traitor to the race? Of course it doesn't, because the issue is not where I work, but what am I doing with the information that I get while I'm working? And for what I know about Irritated Genie, I believe him to be dedicated to his people. I believe him to be a comrade in the struggle, a revolutionary, someone who would lay down his life for his race. And whether he works for them or not, if he does, then I firmly believe that he's using that position as a way to gather information that we can use to our benefit. You have to have people behind enemy lines who can gather the information you need in order for us to fight this struggle. And if he is in that particular line of work, then so be it, because that is one of the most oppressive institutions in this country for African people locally and globally. And I believe with all my heart that if that brother does, in fact, work for Homeland Security, then he's using, he's using that position as a way to amass intelligence that we so desperately need for our struggle. Um, I'm going to repeat my question again. Uh, um, the uh, genie part, uh, I'll, uh, um, I was supposed to read that. Well, uh, I was supposed to say that later. Uh, sorry about that. Um, my question was, is Homeland Security the same as the police and the FBI? Yes, they're all part of the same bureaus. Okay. Um, my uh, next question that uh, goes with uh, what I said, um, Jeannie works for Homeland Security. Um, do you think Homeland Security works with War on the Horizon? No, I do not. Okay. Um, uh, I don't uh, have any more questions at this time. Thank you. Groovy, groovy. And uh, I wanted folks to know for the uh, record that I did 
let uh, Umar Abdullah Johnson know that question was going to come up and that uh, anyone who has any, uh, if that was news to anyone listening, uh, there's a video where he, Irritated Genie, admitted all this. So this is not, you know, any hush-hush information. He has admitted all this on video. I can send you the link so you can check it out uh, yourself. Um, I have audio recording of it, too. So this is not, you know, any breaking news on the cows. You've heard this before, uh, folks who've been tuning in. Uh, at any rate, I'll check the switchboard uh, really quick just to double check to see if anyone has called in uh, with any questions towards the end. Um, if you could, that would be super appreciative. The project that you were talking about um, where you want to get black people uh, who are students now or parents uh, to participate in the documentary, uh, massing their stories. Um, I was just thinking today because I was in the so-called gifted classes. Uh, so I would have a different perspective on the abuse that black people get um, just going through the so-called gifted classes. But it was still horrific. Um, it was hor I mean, to be in that situation where you're consistently one of, you know, maybe two black children in a class of maybe 20, 17 students um, with a white teacher. Uh, it was it was horrific. Um, and to be confused about racism. I mean, it was uh, it was terrible. So, yeah, I would I would love to. Uh, participate. Um, if you could give us more information about the project before we close out, that would be great. Oh, certainly. The Psychoacademic War Against Black Boys is a documentary that I am beginning to work on, and it's going to be a made-for-the-movie documentary, and uh, I am looking for parents as well as educators as well as black boys who were mistreated at any point in their K through 12th grade educational career, whether it be a private school, public school, charter school, or parochial school, you need not be a student at this point. You could be a 75-year-old black man. You could be a 175-year-old black man. But if you were mistreated in any way, shape, or form going through school, be it through violence, miseducation, special education, medication, incarceration, or feminization, and you're willing to tell your story, please get in contact with me. You could do so by telephone or by email, and uh, we could set up that interview so I can get you on tape. If you want to tell your story but you don't want to be identified, that is certainly acceptable. We can actually, uh, as you see on so many television interviews, when a person doesn't want to be identified, then there's a way to actually hide their facial features so no one knows who it is doing the talking. You will not be asked to name the school district, to name any teachers, to name any principals, or to name any school. So we will not name names. Even your own name doesn't have to be known. We simply want the story because we need people to know what is being done against our black boys in public schools. So, again, if there's anyone who has a testimonial, you can be from any state, any city, any school district in this country. You can be an elder. You can be a young person. Even if you know of a story that you know to be correct, and, you will, and you're willing to tell it, and please feel free to get in contact with me, area code 215-989-9858. Again, 215-989-9858. And my email address, Umar Abdullah Johnson at yahoo.com. And you can also request me on Facebook, and I have dozens of videos on YouTube. Wow. I want to double-check really quickly um guest 33 person called in to make sure i didn't miss a question oh she had a hand up he or she guest 33 did you have a question for umar abdullah johnson yes sir i called back in can you hear me i can hear you sir yep this is my uh, second time calling we take off the speaker um i was curious um, as a psychologist uh, any opinions about uh christianity and the black struggle i guess the Christianity and what was that? The uh, black struggle, does it help us? Does it hurt us? Okay. Religions, any tool is neutral in and of itself. Any tool is neutral in and of itself. So you can use Christianity for a revolutionary purpose, or you can use it for an anti-revolutionary purpose. You can use Islam, you can use the Hebrew faith, you can use the Moorish doctrine, you can use the Yoruba doctrine. Any religion in and of itself isn't positive or negative. It's how you use it. Now, I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit and say, do I think religion 
has been used to the benefit of black people or against it. I would say religion has been used to the detriment of black people. There's, there's very few instances where religion has been used constructively and proactively for and by black people. Not just Christianity, but all of them. Okay? All of them. 95% of the time when black people are using religion, it is working against us. We, either, uh, uh, we are either worshiping the Arab culture through Islam, or we're worshiping white Jesus through Christianity, okay? Or we are creating, or we are creating uh, 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 tribes and cliques and gangs through our religion, religious gang banging, where the Muslims don't deal with the Christians, the Christians don't deal with the Hebrews, the Hebrews don't deal with the Moors, the Moors don't deal with the uh, brothers and sisters who follow African traditional religions, you know, for example. Okay, so religion for the most part, has worked against our best interest. And having said that, I would say this, that I think it is in the best interest of black people if we stop practicing all of the major world religions because none of them have helped us. None of them have helped us. I don't know of a church that's doing anything significant for the black community. I damn sure don't know of an imam or a mosque that's doing anything for the good of the black community, you know, and so I think we need to, as Dr. John Henry Clark said, last of the great Pan-African nationalists, if you're not going to find something good to do with it, then throw it into the ash can of history. I think we need to all go back to our African traditional religions. They were maternalistic, not paternalistic. They believed in the great female principle of God as well as the great masculine principle of God. And the three Western religions have God as a man. Men run the religion. There's no respect for women, for children, or for nobody else. I think we need to go back to our traditional faiths. But to answer your question, I think religions can be used for good or for bad. But for most of African history, they have been used for bad. Ruben. Um, wow. Thoroughly enjoyed the program, as usual. As usual, I'm sure uh, most listeners is. I hope uh, the technical difficulties, I hope they were minimal, didn't... Uh, inhibit anyone's ability to uh, appreciate the information. Um, if it is acceptable, uh, I did want to get in one one last question. Actually, uh, I looked at this question and was like, wow, I think this is uh, important enough to see if I can slide in. And, um, I have, People have brought up consistently that they they are ready for action, and specifically they are ready for counter-violence. Um, they understand the problem is white people, uh, and they, you know, want to go out here and get at these white folks. And I contend, you know, a major part of that problem um, is that, number one, what you said, we have most non-white people uh, do not understand at all that we are at war with white people. And I think another part of that problem I mean, that is huge in and of itself that most non-white people do not understand we are at war with white people. But I think a second part of the problem with counterviolence right now is that our instincts, and I mean black people, black people, non-white people, I believe our instincts have been carefully groomed to identify with and seek validation from white people. And I think that is going to be a monumental impediment to any form of counterviolence when we, you know, are seeking to be in bed with, or at least, you know, we're supposed to be chummy. These are our pals. These are not our enemies. Uh, and in fact, our instincts have been groomed uh, to be in conflict with other black people. Uh, do you think that's true? And do you have some techniques that we can correct that problem? Well, see, the issue when it comes down to warfare, particularly direct armed confrontation, we would lose, and we would lose big. And we would lose and lose big because never has an army, except a mythological war, been able to win a war when they are the numerical minority and have no place to which they can escape for rest, to regroup, and to re-strategize. 
any black man who thinks he's going to go to war with the United States government when he doesn't even make a butter knife is fooling himself. I think that we have to stop trying to make a way for ourselves in America. That's ultimately our greatest strategic weakness. 99% of our effort is based on trying to get the United States government or American society to change its attitude towards us. We're not going to change. We have to change our attitude towards them and towards ourselves. Fighting them, getting them to give us rights, getting them to give us a couple states down south like a lot of the black nationalist organizations advocate. Ultimately, all of that is nonsense. We are going to have to leave America. We may not have to leave this year. We may not have to leave in the next 10 years. But before 2100 comes around, I believe that if black people still want to be in existence, they're going to have, we're going to have to leave this country and go to hell back home or go to the Caribbean, go to Brazil, go to Asia, go to some nation with a predominantly African population. And although they are not totally protected from the Europeans, as we said earlier, they do not have a standing army that can match any of the European standing armies. But with our technological sophistication and with the money that we have, we can make Africa, we can make the Caribbean, we can make Brazil, we can make the black nations of Africa strong, independent countries. And even though we may not be able to beat America in a standoff, America would be, would be putting so much of its resources at risk that they would probably decide to not engage us. So again, we are the hope of Africa. We have to stop putting our time and effort into America and start preparing to pack our bags and get the hell out of here. There is no future for black people in America. We're not running from our problems. We are running to our people so that we can prevent these problems from ever totally exterminating our race. Again, uh, our guest, uh, nationally certified school psychologist, Mr. Umar Abdullah Johnson, uh, always uh, a privilege to have you on the program. Um, I know uh, listeners are really thankful you could share a bit of your Monday evening with us. Uh, if there's anything you'd like to say uh, before we wrap up, feel free. Oh, no, sir. I just want to thank you again for the opportunity to get interviewed. And if anyone needs to reach me, again, Facebook, YouTube, my phone number, or my email address. Outstanding. Uh, Mr. Umar Abdullah Johnson, thank you so much. I know a lot of folks out there, they will definitely be getting in touch with you uh, about their children and, and some of your upcoming projects. I hope people get in touch with him about that documentary. I think that, that sounds extremely powerful. And, uh, yeah, I definitely want to check it out as soon as it's available. Um, fifth time on the program, Mr. Umar Abdullah Johnson. Thank you so much for sharing some of your time with us. You. And, uh, have a fantastic evening, sir. Thank you, brother. Peace and love. Yes, sir. Bye. Context of white supremacy. Uh, we will take a quick commercial break, and we will be back. Uh, news report from Justice. And, uh, yeah, we'll give uh, some of the upcoming programs some dates and times and see if you all have some uh, suggestions as well. Uh, context of white supremacy. RacismDaily.com, your number one source for global news reports on race, racism, and overt actions of white supremacy. From Asia to the Americas to Europe to Australia to Africa, racism is not a thing of the past. It is our current reality. Be informed. Be globally informed. You should be the first to know. RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? Racism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, 
even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Do you need a one-stop shop for all of your multimedia needs? Triumphant Multimedia is a skilled team of professionals with a passion for great marketing and chic design. Our specialties include consulting, brand development, copywriting, and creative graphic design. That's second to none. We also offer photography, photo retouching, videography, and video editing. At Triumphant Multimedia, our goal is to provide highly effective creative solutions built to suit any individual need or budget. Give us a call at 678-732-8067 or check us out online at TRI multimedia.com Hello everybody, welcome to the couch. This is Justice here at TalkShoe. If you want to learn, listen, understand a question, go to TalkShoe.com. And in the search box, type in context of white supremacy. And then click the second box down below. And then it'll take you right to it. For more information on racism and white supremacy, go to my blog. Just do justicetoday.blogspot.com. And my email address is justice.rwswj at gmail.com. Replace white supremacy with justice. ASAP. You're just saying just buckets and buckets of work. Our people are very serious about not being very serious. Meanwhile, white people are very serious about playing hardball against us. And this hardball is called genocide. Context of white supremacy. I hope you all uh, got constructive information. Uh, there was even an acronym thrown out. I was going to see if uh, Justice caught that. He presented that before. Laws, legal arm of white supremacy. Uh, acronym thrown out. I guess it's not a an animal acronym, but acronym nonetheless. Um, let's see, we will uh, we will be back on uh, June first. Uh, I have some of the programs uh, plugged in already. It talks you some of the upcoming. Uh, programs. Uh, the children. I'd already said that the children's uh, broadcast about the uh, stupid things that victims of white supremacy. Uh, the children are going to be focusing on some of the stupid things that they observe older victims of white supremacy doing. Um, that was my idea. I think that would be. I just think it would be really interesting. Uh, some of the younger folks who are more informed about racism, white supremacy. Some of the things that they see older non-white people doing that are just absolutely absurd, makes no sense at all. Uh, I think that would be uh, really constructive to hear from younger non-white people. I think they have really fresh insight. Uh, and as I've long said, they have uh, been subjected to a lot less abuse from racist woman and racist man. So a lot of times they have a lot more clarity because of that. So uh, this Saturday, uh, that would be June 4th, Saturday, June 4th, children's program. Uh, it'll be 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, and 4 p.m. Pacific, uh, the children's program. Uh, we are not, you know, encouraging beating up on other victims. This is, you know, to be used just to kind of give uh, some fresh insight to some of the things that we need to correct, some of the things that we need to change. And uh, like I said, I'm just really interested to hear uh, if non-white children, if they're seeing some of the uh, just incorrect things that non-white people are doing, uh, primarily because we are confused about white supremacy. Same thing Umar Abdullah Johnson touched on. Uh, so that's this Saturday, children's program. Uh, also, I guess the day before, or it'll be the same day, depending on your time zone, uh, the black male in the area of the world known as China. He will be on the program. Uh, this, again, depending on your time zone, uh, it'll either be, I guess if you're on the East Coast, it'll be 1 a.m. 
Saturday morning, uh, June 4th, so 1 a.m. Saturday morning, uh, you know, Friday night, however you look at it. Um, if you're uh, on the West Coast, that would be 10 p.m. Pacific, Friday night. So it would be Friday, June 3rd, if you're on the West Coast, um, Friday at 10 p.m. Pacific time. But the black male, uh, he resides in the area of the world known as China. He'll be on the program. He is informed about racism, white supremacy. Uh, he said he's familiar with Mr. Fuller's work, Dr. Welsing's work. He is informed. He does believe system of white supremacy. And apparently he was you know, less confused when he first arrived uh, in China. He's been there for some time now, and he just has a lot of fascinating observations um, Man, <laughs> I've talked to him a couple times now uh, on the phone, and he has just shared uh, really interesting information, some common trends, things that white people do, uh, cowbells definitely in there, um, just really interesting. But he did, he did say that it would help him to be more codified and more constructive for that program if uh, people have questions that they would like to ask, uh, if you would like to know more about what's going on in that area of the world, if you could perhaps write the questions in ahead of time, you could put them on the Facebook page, you could email them, and he said that would just help him to be uh, better with his words if he kind of has some idea of what people want to know. Um, so you can, you can email them to me. My email is untiljustice at gmail.com until justice at gmail dot com. You can email them or you can, you know, put them on the Facebook, whatever. Um but yeah, he said that would be helpful. Uh, I'm gonna try and get him some of my questions before um I guess Friday evening Pacific time as well. Um Justice, you know, if you can get him some questions maybe uh before the program that would be helpful for him to codify. But I think that that should be really interesting. I'm looking forward to it. As I said, I think uh this will help a lot. Um, provide clarity about the system of white supremacy. And I think, you know, this is a big way you should compare and contrast things that you hear uh, when we discuss racism, white supremacy, things that you hear pop up everywhere in the world. Doesn't matter if we talk to someone in Australia, uh, Israel, Nigeria, doesn't matter where the person is on the planet. This pops up when racism, white supremacy pops up. That is noteworthy. Uh, when we talk to someone or analyze racism, white supremacy in a specific spot, and you don't hear specific things pop up, note that as well. That too is interesting because you know it does change uh, depending on where you are, depending which you know white people are in charge. Um, so yeah, just pay attention to that. I think uh, I think that will prove to be very constructive. That's this weekend. Uh, we have some, man, there is a white guy. He wrote this book uh, about, it's kind of like a remake of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, except it's Huckleberry Finn and Zombie Jim. And so instead of Nigger Jim, it's Zombie Jim. And Zombie Jim, he is this flesh-eating dead character accompanying uh, little white Huckleberry Finn. Uh, and, I mean, white people are clowning out of control. Clowning out of control. I just found this. Like I said, their affinity for, you know, the racism in Huckleberry Finn and, and all that, you know, that aside. But, I mean, clowning out of control. He's gonna. He's supposed to send me a copy of the book and come on the program um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think this will be another uh, Daryl Bain. And this, I think this guy is a lot younger, too. So this, this should be interesting. But that should be coming up. Like I said, I'm, uh, the attempt is to broadcast every day for June. Hopefully we'll run into the new website being up. And, uh, yeah, if you have suggestions, uh, you can put it on the Facebook page. I'll try to uh, get as much as we can. Uh, it can be, you know, programs to codify words. I think that would be very important. Um, anything, you know, any ideas, whatever, let them fly. Um, yeah, let them fly. We have, we should be very busy for the month of June. Uh, with that, uh, we can do our news report. Uh, Justice, do you have a news item? Let's see, uh, Justice, are you, uh, still with us? Oh, let's see. Make sure she's still on the line. Justice, are you... Uh, oh? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, that was strange. Uh, 
Um, uh, this news report was from racismdaily.com. It was posted on May 18th of this year. Um, the title is White Teachers Sue Philadelphia School Over Discrimination. Um, the reason why I picked this one was because um, uh, Umar uh, uh, Umar Abdul Johnson uh, is from uh, is from is from is from Philadelphia, and um, he uh, he talk uh, well. He works at a school, and um, he's uh, I believe a teacher. Uh, so yeah, that is why I, I picked this one. Four white teachers at a Philadelphia. Um, Elementary schools say they suffered various forms of race-based, desperate treatment at the hands of administrators, including being accused by a principal of being unfit to teach the African American students. As part of professional development at Thomas Mifflin Elementary School, a former principal forced employees to read an article instructing the teachers that white teachers do not have the ability have the uh, have the ability to teach African American students, non-white Black students. According to four according to four federal complaints filed last week, the teachers say that the school's former principal Char Charles Ray III, who is Black, established an atmosphere of distrust and favor and favoritism, in which white teachers were relationships with their students were repeatedly sa sabotaged. Uh, the teachers say the racial discrimination was ubiquitous and prevented them from doing their jobs. Schedules were changed without notice and access to school supplies was denied. Room assignments were randomly switched and poor pro professional performance marks were issued for the teachers simply because of their race, according to, to the suit. Meanwhile, Ray let black teachers overlook, override, or flat out ignored school and rules, uh, ignore, ignore school rules and, and, and policies. Um, according to the complaints, Ray also made sure that black teachers controlled the union and weeded out white rep, rep, pen, represent uh, in a scheme that ignored union voting pr procedure, the teachers claim. As such, the Philadelphia Fe Federation of Teachers Union failed to provide proper re representation when teachers filed gr grievances. When the teachers uh, complained, they became the targets of an, of an investigation the goal of which was to intimidate, harass, and find buy it, and find bases for firing, according to their suit. They say their personal information, including about at, uh, addresses, were disclosed to a hired in investigator, causing them to fear for the family's safety. Each teacher seeks more than $150,000 alleging uh, vi violations of various civil rights sta uh, statutes. Uh, yeah, statutes. They also request relief for invasion of, of privacy, due process violations, defamation, infliction of emotional d distress, tor tortures in, in inter uh, with contractual relations and civil con conspiracy. Named as defendants are the Philadelphia School District, the Union Ray fellow teacher, Cheryl is Islam, no, uh, Ish Ishmael, and two uh, other as yet unknown high official defendants. One attorney for the teachers Patricia Heenan of Bluebell, uh, PA, uh, told Courthouse News that the discrimination was continuous and distressing, but declined to discuss certain aspects of the at the allegations 
not addressed in the complaints themselves. A spoken a spokesperson from the school district of Philadelphia did not immediately respond to a request for comment. That is the end of the article. Uh, one thing that stood out to me, um, and I mean many things, many things, um, but one thing in particular that stood out to me um, in that report, the teachers say the racial discrimination was ubiquitous and prevented them from doing their job. Uh, I, I just wanted to share the definition of ubiquitous, just, you know, in the interest of clarity, not insulting anyone's intelligence, just in the interest of clarity, ubiquitous, adjective, present, appearing, or found everywhere. His ubiquitous influence was felt by all. Cowboy hats are ubiquitous among the male singers. I'll go back to the article again. The teachers say the racial discrimination was ubiquitous. Mm. Context of white supremacy. Do you have any thoughts about that that article, uh, Justice? Um. Just uh, um, uh, white teachers uh, mistreating uh, non-white students, and uh, the and the white teachers do not want to uh, uh, teach uh, the African American students, meaning non-white students, black students, um, uh, to help them learn. <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can get that on. <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can get that on the website for the cows. I'm gonna see if I can get that sentence. The teachers say the racial discrimination was ubiquitous. I want that I want that on the website. Like uh, if anyone has any questions about, you know, why we're trying to broadcast every day next month and, you know, why this is the biggest problem. Anyone has any questions? The teachers say the racial discrimination was ubiquitous. That's why. Do you have any thought? Any uh, any other thoughts you wanted to share? Um, anything about the program? Anything uh, Umar Abdullah Johnson shared? Um, is uh, do you think um uh Umar? Well, no, well, never mind. I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, uh, mess up anything. So yeah, uh, never mind. And uh, no, I don't have anything else. Right on, right on. Um, I did have uh, something I was thinking of in terms of codification around words. It's really tough. Like it's been a strain. Um, <laughs> it's been a strain for me to think of ways to codify because um, that's not how I learned codification, and I haven't mastered it. So you know. <laughs> Maybe yeah, I should be I should be open to uh, suggestions and such, and I am. I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, and one of the things that I thought of we could do, and this is I'm stealing from Josh Wicket. He used to take news articles and codify them, meaning he would substitute terms uh, for the most accurate terms within the context of white supremacy. So, like that sentence uh, to codify it, the teachers say. Racism, white supremacy, was ubiquitous, right? Like that would be codified because racial discrimination is not the most accurate term. Um, so I'm thinking that's one thing we could do. We could bring articles and codify them and just read them. And then people could try to select which terms, you know, we had to substitute. Like just read the codified version and then we could, you know, pick out which terms we think the person had to change to codify. I think that would be a constructive exercise um, in getting people to focus on the importance of term and to see if anything slips. That'll be, that would be real interesting if people think, you know, there's a word that 
should have been codified or could be codified to more accurately reveal truth. I think that would be a great exercise. That's one thing we could do. Um, I was thinking uh, we could even go back to the archives with some of the programs with white people. I'm stealing this one, too. Mr. Williams thought this would, would be a good idea. Take some of the clips where white people have been here and kind of break down where they, you know, uh, I think uh, 909 calls them logical fallacies. <laughs> they are practicing racism, white supremacy with their words to kind of do a play by play slow motion of what they're doing, what they're saying. Uh, I think that would be very constructive. And then we could kind of give uh, some tactics on how to go about that. I think we could do that. Um, I would not be willing to do that with any of the non white guests who've been on the program. I'll just I'll be I was thinking about that. I absolutely would not be willing to do that with any non white guest who's been on the program for any reason. But any white person that's been on, I am game. Um, I don't care who it is. Uh, yeah, any white person is game. If you think a white person, if you have specific white people or specific programs that you have in mind, like, yeah, that particular white person was um, doing, you know, such and such or were using a particular term. I know one term I don't like, man, uh, Dr. Joe Fegan. Uh, I think it's recovering racist. I think that's the term he used. Man, uh, that's that's one recovering racist. And I think some other people have used that term, too. But anyway, um, if you can think of some broadcasts where white people have been here that you would like to dissect and kind of do slow motion, um, that would be great. There have been a lot of white people here. The archives are up. Um, yeah, we can do that. If you all have other suggestions on codification, um, I will I will entertain those as well. Um, let's see. I'm checking the, uh, chat room just to see, uh, if anyone has, anyone has any questions. I know the white people, I suspect white people who practice racism, white supremacy might have been in the chat room. I saw some of the names, even some of the names. I think one was, I want to kill crackers. I suspect that too was one of the white people, uh, because, you know, I just do not, I've said repeatedly, do not name call, do not name call white people. Uh, I do not, you know, use that language uh, on the program. I do not encourage other non-white people to do it. I don't think it's constructive. It's not going to solve this problem at all. Uh, it's a real juvenile way of going about racism, white supremacy. And in fact, I think these are probably white people. I suspect white supremacists. Um, at any rate, I don't really see any suggestions around the codification. I, I thought those were, uh, you know, I think those are good. I, I haven't heard any others, so I think uh, those are good ideas. Um, the newspaper articles, we can codify those. We can make a program date and time for that. And uh, we can, uh, thank you, I got assistance from a victim. Uh, we can codify that. And um, let's see, the, the clips from programs where white people um, where white people were on the program, we can kind of go back and do the slow motion uh, and break that down as well. Um, let's see, we have five minutes left. I'll check the phone lines. Um, I'll check the phone lines to see if anyone has anything they'd like to say in the last five minutes. Um, <laughs> I'm going to close the chat room because nobody's offered any suggestions, so I'll close the chat room. I'll get in. I hate the chat room. I've always hated the chat room. Uh, I think that was one of the best decisions that we made on this program to uh, nix the chat room. Uh, I just think it's a big uh, distraction. Uh, listening, listening skills. Uh, see, I'm checking the phone lines. Uh, guest 33, person that called in from California, your lines are open. Did you all have anything to share? I'm trying to remember the people that asked questions. Uh, sir, no. Um, as always, a great show. And I'm going to mute myself and continue listening until the show's off tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, California, New York, PRISM, Southeast Pennsylvania. I don't really recall which people had questions and which people did not. Um, did you all have questions or comments? Yes, sir. I have a comment more or less about the situation going on in Philadelphia. Um, I find it interesting that you mentioned the word, I think it was ubiquitous, ubiquitous and um, educated us on what that meant. Now, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was a handful of people that's involved in that suit and if it was ubiquitous, then it would be more people. Now, um, this whole thing about counter-racism, 
when as I'm reading between the lines, as I'm listening and trying to get an understanding of what's really going on, it sounds to me as if someone in authority exerted their right as an authority figure, and these um, non-white, I mean these white individuals became offended and exercised their power base. I would be interested. I'm gonna follow the story, and I would be interested in seeing how the Philadelphia school system responds to this. Will they pay them off? Will there be further confusion in the ranks? Meaning that Alpha was already underfunded, and in some instances, I feel as if the teachers are not as qualified as they could or should be. So when you when when the, when the um, location Bluebell, which is a suburb outside of Philadelphia, was mentioned. That means that it's someone who do not represent the population, teaching the population, and also coming from a totally different um, neighborhood, the suburb, basically. So you got a suburbanite coming into the city to teach children that they have no idea about. And so I really want to follow this um, story, and I'm thankful um, for Justice reading it to us, providing a news report. Words, I hope that further illustrates sometimes words tell you everything. That is a fantastic point. If the racism was ubiquitous, it should be a whole lot of people in this suit if the racism was ubiquitous. Exactly. It's all uh, googly got. And I think it's, and which is just basically noise and confusion and um, just activities to further confuse the point. And so I, I'm interested in following and reading um, information as presented by the newspapers, and hopefully I could locate someone who's actually in that school district um, and find out, you know, what, what, what's the real deal, what's really going on. Because it's a waste of taxpayers' money. I mean, when you think about the legal fees, um, the time that's going to be spent, it's just, oh, you know what else, guys? The fact that they said they felt unsafe, that this whole um, idea of just always feeling fearful that there's going to be some harm done to their families, which is amazing to me. I mean, you're having problems at work. You feel discriminated against. But you're telling me you think the superintendent and other um, administrators are going to actually come and, and I don't know, I, I don't know, kill you and your whole family? I don't understand where the feeling of, a lack of safety. I don't understand where that came from, or if that was thrown in for good measure. I'm absolutely amazed. <laughs> absolutely. We have uh, about two two minutes left. I think I am going to do. Wow, well, I'll decide. I'm thinking about doing a very brief program tomorrow, like 30 minutes, like <laughs> really brief. I'll decide and let you all know. We have uh, two minutes left in the program. Uh, the caller from Louisiana, uh, he was on the Skype. I think you were on your uh, Skype line. Uh, I opened your line as well. We have about two minutes left if you all want to share anything. Um, I just wanted to, to thank our brother Umar for that, um, for the response. Um, when this, this question came up about um, gays being a part of the revolution, I pretty much um, answered the question the same way, um, not getting angry, not blaming, calling names, or anything like that, but um, there were quite a few people there who were really upset at my answer, and um, yeah, I just, your, your thoughts on it too, Gus, and anyone else that wants to share. That homosexual thing is really, uh, I mean, it's big, I mean, Kobe Bryant fined $100,000, I mean, you will get in a lot of trouble. White people have created an environment. Um, I just, I'd be very clear since we're on codification. I have already concluded that white equals racist, white supremacist. Now, for the people who don't think that's true, you know, you can say uh, suspected racists or the most powerful white people uh, or racist, white supremacists. There's a lot of ways, if, you know, to codify that. But I have concluded that white equals racist. So, white people. Uh, have created an environment, I think Umar Abdullah Johnson would say social engineering, where, you know, it is extremely favorable to so-called homosexual, anti-sexual behavior. And if you are doing anything, saying anything that looks like you want to talk bad about that or talk bad about them, man, they have made it so that you will not feel comfortable. You could get in trouble. 
uh, Kobe Bryant fined a hundred thousand um, dollars. Joakim fifty thousand dollar fine for Joakim Noah just for saying uh, something about so-called homosexual, or excuse me, just saying the word faggot. Hundred thousand dollar fine. So I mean. Uh, yeah, that would be my response, and I think the behavior is totally incorrect, uh, and we will have further to say about this. That would be the end of the program. Uh, replace white supremacy with justice immediately. And, uh, yeah, we'll be back uh, maybe tomorrow, but definitely June 1. Cows signing out. Peace.